This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 191st edition of the program. Today is Thursday, May 2nd, and before we get the show started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up just this last week to support us for the first time or increased their monthly pledge. And that includes Bang Duong, Beer Farts 68, love that name, Charles Dobner, Christian Veneman, Dork Sighted, Drew Simonson, Hunter P, Inform Forum, Yvette Correa, Jamie Allister, Jerome Descoteau, Joe Cleanot, John Michael Demise, Lionel Garza, Marcos Marchant, Rodrigo D, Sanfarnia, Sharon Shore, Tina McElroy, and Wendy Melly. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by visiting humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or underneath any one of our YouTube videos, you can click join, and that will immediately give you access to our content. And I usually will upload videos for members early if I get them edited in advance, and you get access to interviews, everybody gets access to the, um, the full episodes early, so it's definitely you know, something to look into if you support the show. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, Biden and Bernie's teams go head to head on the issue of health care. Elizabeth Warren calls out Biden's corruption. Joe Biden's past stance on flag desecration comes back to bite him in the ass. Bernie's reception at she the people wasn't necessarily ideal. Bernie calls out Biden's abysmal record, and he also reclaims the narrative when it comes to voting rights. Jacob Wohl smears Pete Buttigieg, and finally, we close the week by talking about Joe Biden's stance on Venezuela, and I talked to Peter Dow about his upcoming book and our past rivalry. So these topics will be discussed on this episode. I hope you guys enjoy the show. Let's go ahead and get into it. At his campaign kickoff event in Pennsylvania, Joe Biden outlined his vision for healthcare reform in America. And I think to nobody's surprise, he does not support Medicare for all, although to his credit, he does have a plan. And that plan is a public option. Now, if you'll recall, back when he was vice president, Obama's administration also publicly supported a public option, although they didn't even propose it when they were talking about the Affordable Care Act. So I don't think that Joe Biden has much credibility here, but nonetheless, he is basically telling Bernie Sanders to bring it on. Not necessarily Joe Biden, but his team and Bernie's team, they've already kind of started this rivalry when it comes to the issue of health care, and now they're competing to prove to America whose vision is better, the more incrementalist, moderate approach with Biden or Bernie's plan, which actually would solve the healthcare crisis in America and end the debate once and for all. So as you can see, you already know where I stand on this. I think Bernie Sanders absolutely has the credibility needed on this issue. But nonetheless, I want to share an article that was written by Jeff Stein of the Washington Post, where he kind of outlines the rivalry between these two candidates here. I think this is interesting. So Jeff Stein writes, Joe Biden on Monday endorsed a public option that would allow all Americans to buy into a Medicare-like health insurance plan as allies of both the former vice president and 2020 presidential rival, Senator Bernie Sanders begin to debate the Democratic Party's health care agenda. Whether you're covered through your employer or on your own or not, you should have the choice to buy into a public option plan for Medicare. Your choice, Biden said during a campaign event in Pittsburgh. If the insurance company isn't doing right by you, you should have another choice. Sanders has called for enrolling every American on the Medicare program, a single-payer system, and an aide to the campaign took a swipe at Biden's decision to attend a private fundraiser that included health insurance executives last week. Biden is also expected to say he shares with single-payer activists the goal of universal coverage and lower health care costs, but that he does not 
support Medicare for All, the advisor said. He may reprise Hillary Clinton's argument in 2016 that her more incremental approach would build on the policies of the Obama administration rather than replacing the Affordable Care Act with a single-payer system. We are all trying to get to a place where we achieve universal health care. I think he sees it like that, the advisor said. But if they want to go after him and Obama about their approach to health care, bring it on. Anyone defending the current dysfunctional system needs to explain why the average family should have to pay $28,000 a year for health care, while the CEO of Independence Health Group, Daniel Hilferty, made $4.8 million last year, an aide to Sanders campaign said in a statement. So the first thing that I want to note is that the Biden aide who is quoted here is basically gaslighting people. Because apparently, you know, he's trying to pay lip service to us and say, look, I agree with your goal that we need to lower healthcare costs and we need to get to 100% coverage. But if you actually agreed with that, then you would obviously opt for the policy that would put that into practice. It's Medicare for all. That's the one way that you get to 100% coverage and the lowest healthcare costs. So if you're not supporting that, then you don't get to gaslight us and make us think that you share the same goal with us because you don't. Your goal is actually at odds. Now, again, I want to remind you, because I think this is incredibly relevant here to this conversation, Joe Biden already said that he supports a public option, as did Obama back in 2008. You didn't even put it in the Affordable Care Act when we were debating health care reform. You didn't even propose it. So you told us... You support a public option, you then get elected, you have a super majority, you didn't go for Medicare for all, and you didn't even go for a public option. Why should we believe you now? The answer is obvious. We should not believe him because Joe Biden has no credibility here because, I mean, he launched his campaign by doing big money fundraisers, one of which was with a healthcare industry executive. And the reason why Joe Biden doesn't want robust health care reform, such as Medicare for All, is because he's afraid of the health insurance industry. Because he knows that if he gets on board with Medicare for All, he would lose any donors from that industry that are thinking about donating to him. Now, contrast that with Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders isn't afraid of the healthcare industry. In fact, the opposite is true. They're afraid of him because their stocks have tanked ever since Bernie Sanders reintroduced his Medicare for All bill. And this also has worried investors. And on top of that, health insurance companies like Anthem, who offer Medicare Advantage plans, they've actually increased benefits as a direct result of Bernie's threats to do away with them because they know that people are on Bernie Sanders' side specifically because they rip people off. And because they're so greedy, they shot themselves in the foot because every single American has experience with a health insurance company. They do not like their health insurance company. Now, when you look at public opinion polls, you'd see that people don't want to lose their health insurance plan that they have. But if you actually ask people why they support their health insurance, it's not because the health insurance company that they have is giving them a phenomenal deal. It's because they want to keep their doctor and they're worried about stability. Now, thankfully, a majority of Americans now support Medicare for All, largely due to Bernie's relentless advocacy for Medicare for All. In fact, even a majority of Republicans now support Medicare for All. But yet we have a Biden advisor getting extremely cocky, telling Bernie's team to bring it on. Are you sure you want that? Because you should be careful what you wish for. Because who do you think Americans are going to side with when it comes to the issue of health care? Who do you think the Democratic Party's base will side with in this debate? The guy who's been a champion of Medicare for all for his whole life, who has health insurance companies running scared, or the guy who surrendered before the fight even began, wouldn't even propose a public option because he was too afraid about what health insurance companies would think. Joe Biden has zero credibility when it comes to the issue of health care. And I'm excited that there's this rivalry brewing because it's going to demonstrate that Joe Biden is not just weak on this issue, but he's also a puppet of the health insurance industry because he's not trying to come up with a policy that would appease the American people. He's doing this so he can appease his donors 
who are holding fundraisers for him. And that's what this is about. So I'm sorry, I'm going to side with the guy who has the health insurance industry shaking in their boots right now, not the guy who capitulated back in 2009. We remember that, Joe Biden. When you and Obama said that you support a public option, for you to not even propose that with the Affordable Care Act shows that you're a coward. You capitulate when the fight doesn't even start, you surrender before it begins, and you don't even want to go up against the health insurance industry. So if you want Bernie's team to bring it on, be careful what you wish for, because I am definitely interested in seeing you two debate this. You have zero credibility on this, Joe. Zero. There have been numerous times over the course of the last couple of years when Elizabeth Warren has disappointed me. Obviously, we all knew that she showed that she isn't very courageous politically when she refused to endorse Bernie Sanders. She did not go out to Standing Rock when water protectors were being brutalized by militarized police. And on TYT, when she was asked about some members of the Democratic Party being more centrist, more conservative, more corporatist, specifically when she was talking about Joe Manchin, she offered up a spirited defense of Joe Manchin, who basically is just a Democrat in name only. He is functionally a Republican. So I've been frustrated with Elizabeth Warren, and I've stated before that she lacks political courage because she's not willing to take on her own party. Now, when you contrast her with someone like Tulsi Gabbard, who endorsed Bernie, who went to Standing Rock, who is fighting against her own party, it's easy to see that Elizabeth Warren does not have any political courage whatsoever. She has essentially been spineless. And I don't like to say that because it seems really harsh, but for the most part, she hasn't been willing to take a stand if, for whatever reason, that would make her fall out of favor with the party or if it would offend elites, specifically Democratic Party elites. However, Joe Biden announced, and she actually came out with a pretty strong criticism of him, that it made me smile because she is slowly but surely working to earn my respect back. And I wanted to share this with you guys because I thought it was great. Our disagreement is a matter of public record. Uh, at a time when the biggest financial institutions in this country were trying to put the squeeze on millions of hardworking families who were in bankruptcy because of medical problems, job losses, divorce and death in the family. Uh, there was nobody to stand up for them. I got in that fight because uh, they just didn't have anyone. And Joe Biden was on the side of the credit card companies. It's all a matter of public record. That was short but sweet. And it's effective because just that statement really tells you everything that you need to know about Joe Biden. He had the opportunity to take a stand for the American people. But who did he side with? The credit card companies. And I like how she's kind of preemptively disarming the people who argue that you shouldn't attack other Democrats. And the way that she's disarming them is essentially by saying, look, the disagreements that I have with Joe Biden are a matter of public record. So this isn't an attack. I'm just stating what I've already said. And there are already people saying that if you have a criticism of another Democrat running for president, you should bite your tongue. Like, for example, George Takai put out a tweet saying, you know, I pledge to not criticize any Democrat because that could bring down the eventual nominee and make them weaker against Donald Trump. That is such a mealy mouthed way to look at politics. You're essentially asking progressives to unilaterally disarm because we know that the media, the establishment, corporate Democrats will relentlessly attack progressives. So really what you're asking is for us to not criticize other um, politicians, but we're not going to do that. That's what primaries are about. You vet the candidates, you criticize them, and then whoever wins, wins. But if you don't actually vet these candidates, if you don't criticize them for their record, for substantive reasons, you are denying voters the chance to know about these candidates. We need the electorate to be informed going into the voting booth so they're able to make an educated decision and not just vote for Joe Biden because of name recognition, because of nostalgia for Obama. People need to know that, as Elizabeth Warren points out, he stood with the credit card companies. Now, what she's talking about here in particular is a bill from 2005, and as Rachel Frazen of The Hill reports, 
In 2005, Biden voted for the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act. Critics have said the law enabled credit card companies to target people seeking bankruptcy protection. And this is a bill that was sponsored by Chuck Grassley and signed into law by President George W. Bush. If that doesn't speak to how terrible Joe Biden's record is, then I don't think anything else will. But we don't even need just this one example. He voted for the Iraq War. He voted for NAFTA. He voted to repeal Glass-Steagall. Joe Biden has essentially reliably been on the wrong side of every single issue. So for us to not point that out, for people like Elizabeth Warren to not point that out, is preposterous. If you're choosing to not criticize these candidates, you're making them weaker going up against Donald Trump. Because would you rather them criticize someone like Joe Biden for this now and give him time to come up with a response? Or would you rather this manifest during the uh, 2020 general election if Biden wins, God forbid, but if he wins? And then Trump does his fake populism thing and then this comes back to bite Biden in the ass. Wouldn't you want voters to know about this now? So ultimately, they pick the best candidate. I mean, I don't get that, but... um. I don't necessarily see as much pushback against Warren criticizing Biden here as I initially expected. And I think it's because the establishment, for the most part, they feel safer with Elizabeth Warren and they don't necessarily view her as the threat that she really is yet because she's not polling at, you know, um, top three or even top four. But in the event she starts to move up, um, in the event she were in Bernie's position, I think that they would have criticized her for speaking out against Biden like this. So kudos to her. I'm glad that she decided to speak up. Um, we can't self-censor under the guise of not wanting to weaken a candidate during a primary. So I'm glad that Warren is kind of bucking party orthodoxy here and she's criticizing him because if you sided with the credit card companies, then, um, Sorry, that's a pretty big mark against you, and that's just an objective fact. Don't blame us for pointing out what Joe Biden did. Blame Joe Biden for having a garbage record in the first place. I've said this once, I'll say it again. Joe Biden, throughout history, has reliably been on the wrong side of basically every single issue. Every single issue. And even when it comes to issues that are no-brainers, that a so-called progressive should not have to think very much about he's taken the wrong side of the issue. He's been on the wrong side of history. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, CNN published an article that talked about how he was functionally on the side of segregationists because while he personally was against segregation, he sought support from fervent segregationists in order to oppose busing. Now, on top of that, he voted for NAFTA, he voted for the Iraq War, he wrote the crime bill, and he's just been on the wrong side of pretty much every issue that's a no-brainer. Now, you all know where Donald Trump stands when it comes to one very specific, specific issue, and that is uh, flag burning. Trump wants people to uh, be punished legally for desecration of the flag. Turns out Joe Biden had a similar stance back in 1989. Rewrote the statute saying, burning the flag in and of itself is a crime, period, boom. Because if you look out there, you know, the thing that makes a Frenchman French or a, a, an Englishman English is their ethnicity. It's not what form of government they happen to live under. You can't define an American in terms anything other than the form of government that we live under. And so it seems to me that making that symbol, give it in a special place, a special unifying notion in times of peace as well as war, is an important and worthy thing to do. And that's why I introduced the bill. For free speech, I cannot yell fire in a crowded movie theater in the name of free speech. I cannot take actions to incite a riot in the name of free speech. So let's get clear here that there's nothing absolute about the First Amendment or any other amendment. Number two, the court, if you, you live in a house that was part of the Historic Preservation Act, even though you own that house, you can't go in and knock out the front windows. You own it. 
you cannot stand in front of your house that you own, that is protected as part of historic preservation, and say, in the name of protesting the decadence of America, I'm burning this house down. Because by law, the house in and of itself cannot be changed. It doesn't relate to the communicative impact. And that's why a statute is legal, and that's why everyone from a liberal professor like Larry Tribe to less liberal people like the dean of uh, like the University of Virginia Law School and Duke Law School and others have come out and said, you can do this by statute and it would be constitutional. Now... <laughs> That's bad. Um, does it mean that Joe Biden currently supports that position? Not necessarily, but I think that this video is important because it speaks to him having a very conservative past and being on the wrong side of another issue. Now, the reason why those clips were a little bit jump cutty was because Zaid Jelani tweeted out multiple videos and multiple tweets. So I kind of just took all of those and created a compilation based on that. He kind of stated his position. And then there was a jump in between there where he was responding to a question by a caller about it and, you know, how this would or would not violate the First Amendment. Now, it's funny that he says that, you know, this doesn't actually violate free speech because there are limits to freedom of speech and whatnot. You can't yell fire in a crowded room. And of course, this is this is true. You know, no freedom is absolute. But when it comes to this issue, what I find especially alarming here is that he said all of this a month after the Supreme Court had already ruled on the constitutionality of this very issue. Now, the case I'm referring to is Texas v. Johnson, when, as Oyas explains, in 1984, in front of the Dallas City Council, Gregory Lee Johnson burned an American flag as a means of protest against Reagan administration policies. Johnson was tried and convicted under a Texas law outlining flag desecration. He was sentenced to one year in jail and assessed a $2,000 fine. After the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals reversed the conviction, the case went to the Supreme Court. Now, before we get to the verdict here, just think about this. He was sentenced to a year in jail and a $2,000 fine, all because he burned a piece of material. How insane is that? How inherently totalitarian is that? Where you essentially have to worship the state. I mean, that's... It's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. And on its face, I think it's easy for anyone to see that that is against the First Amendment. Obviously, flag desecration would fall under protected speech. And can you guess how the Supreme Court held? Well, in a 5-4 to four decision... They agreed that yes, flag burning and flag desecration, that is protected speech. And even Scalia and Anthony Kennedy were in the majority here. Now, Oyas continues saying in a five to four decision, the court held that Johnson's burning of the flag was protected expression under the First Amendment. The court found that Johnson's actions fell into the category of expressive conduct and had a distinctively political nature. The fact that an audience takes offense to certain ideas or expression the court found does not justify prohibitions of speech. The court also held that state officials did not have the authority to designate symbols to be used to communicate only limited sets of messages, noting that if there is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment, it is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. So the court releases this decision, and then a month later, Joe Biden was on C-SPAN, making the case as to why we need to criminalize flag desecration. Now, what's interesting is that there were other individuals, his colleagues, that didn't want to just, you know, introduce legislation to do this because obviously the Supreme Court had already invalidated it. So people who were really fervently in favor of making desecration of the flag illegal proposed a constitutional amendment. So another issue that, again, to emphasize here, I don't know if he still has this view. I hope he moved away from it, but it's just one of many issues where Joe Biden 
was on the wrong side of history. If you'll recall, he wrote the 1994 crime bill. He voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, which banned same-sex marriages at the federal level. He supported NAFTA, the Iraq War, the Patriot Act, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. And that list is by no means a comprehensive list because there's also the Anita Hill situation. There's also the Lucy Flores situation. And I think the more serious one is Anita Hill, where he was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and he stopped witnesses from testifying. Other women who would have validated Anita Hill's testimony with evidence, he didn't allow them to testify. And he basically said, look, everything's fair game, even in embarrassing questions. And he asked her, what's the most embarrassing thing that um, happened or that Clarence Thomas, you know, did to you or said to you? I'm paraphrasing, but Basically, something that you don't want to ask the victim of sexual harassment who's already been through enough, who probably doesn't feel comfortable testifying. So, Joe Biden lacks a crucial thing that all presidential candidates should have, and that is foresight. He can't tell when he's wrong. He doesn't anticipate how history will judge him. And this is coming back to bite him in the ass now. So, hopefully, he moved away from this position, but nonetheless... I mean, to take that stance, it's just honestly, really, it's puzzling to me. I don't see why of all the issues to be concerned with that's affecting the world and the U.S., uh, you, you'd go for flag burning. Who gives a shit? If it's offensive to you, suck it up, snowflake, okay? This is why I don't like how the left and really SJWs quote-unquote on college campuses are always attacked for being overly sensitive and needing, you know, safe spaces. Because if an SJW on a college campus is offended, they protest. But if a right-wing or centrist SJW in Congress is offended, they make laws that actually ban speech. So who's the real threat to free speech? Is it students on college campuses who will use their speech to combat speech that they don't like? Or is it the lawmakers who are constantly attacking our free speech rights. It's bad enough that Joe Biden voted for the Patriot Act, but um, he was also against the First Amendment as well. So this is reason one of 350 why we should not allow Joe Biden to get anywhere near the nomination. Because if he wins, imagine how many people will be so disenchanted with another centrist will just choose to stay home. We saw how having a centrist at the top of the ticket panned out last time, and you don't have to think too hard about what would happen if we did the same thing again. So Joe Biden is an awful choice, and I hope that Democrats don't vote for him just because of name recognition and nostalgia for the Obama years. Let's move forward, not look backwards at someone who clearly is not the right person to be the leader of a Democratic Party base that is increasingly progressive. At Bernie Sanders' 2020 campaign kickoff rally, I want to remind you of a very specific criticism that former Hillary Clinton staffer Zerlina Maxwell had on MSNBC about Bernie Sanders' speech. But but look, um, I, there were a couple times that you yeah. had a couple eye rolls and just <laughs> explain explain your thoughts as you were listening to Bernie Sanders. Look, I, I work for Hillary Clinton, so I have a lot there of you go. opinions. That was about, it, right there, <laughs> uh, Bernie Sanders. Um, but you know, to be very serious about it, I clocked it. He did not. Mention race or gender until 23 minutes into the speech. And just for point of comparison, I went back and looked at Elizabeth Warren's opening speech, for example. She mentions race and discrimination in the first paragraph. So that's a big difference. Except Bernie Sanders actually did do what she claimed he did not do. As Walid Shahid points out, at the three-minute mark, he thanked Sean King for his work on criminal justice reform. At the six-minute mark, he discussed fighting Trump's sexism and racism. At the 13-minute mark, he discussed mass incarceration. Now, once she was called out and fact-checked, really, she then kind of backtracked and stated, Okay, I've rewatched since yesterday, and while I can't acknowledge that I missed the passing line at six minutes, I stand by my point since talking about criminal justice is not the same thing as talking about race and gender, and if you don't get why, Bernie won't win. Again. So obviously she refused to take the L, even though she was 
thoroughly refuted. And she claims, look, talking about criminal justice reform is not the same thing as talking about sex and gender. Except in the actual tweet by Walid Shahid that she quote tweeted when she responded there, at the six minute mark, Bernie Sanders did talk about racism and sexism, specifically within the context of fighting Donald Trump's racism and sexism. So either she lacks reading or listening comprehension skills, or she's just being purposefully obtuse so she can smear Bernie Sanders in any way possible. And I will assume it's the latter because Zerlina Maxwell is a very intelligent person. I think she knows what she's doing and she's trying to interpret what Bernie Sanders is saying in the least charitable way possible so she can make him look bad because she's a former Clinton staffer. And as she admitted in that clip, you know, she has some feelings about this. So she doesn't have any credibility at all. But nonetheless, she was still on Bill Maher's show. And they were talking about Bernie's appearance at a recent She the People event where he was actually booed when asked about the federal government's role in fighting white nationalism. And when the hosts followed up because they did didn't feel as if Bernie Sanders adequately answered the question. He mentioned how he marched with MLK and he was subsequently booed because he brought that up. And what a YouTube channel called Spitting Back did was they actually fact-checked her in real time as she talked about this on Bill Maher's show and everything she says Bernie should have done, they play the clip of Bernie Sanders doing exactly what she said he didn't do. Now, to be clear here, she was talking specifically about Bernie Sanders' answer about white nationalism, but nonetheless, if she would have tuned in to see his full interview, everything she recommended that he do, he did do throughout the course <laughs> of this interview. And it's bizarre, so take a look at this compilation here because it, it really speaks to how hacky Zerlina Maxwell is. The, the women in the audience wanted to hear specifics and Bernie Sanders did not answer the question. That's what the boos were for. And that means, by the way, not only specific plans and programs, it means a fundamental change in the culture of this country. Discrimination of all forms has got to end, period. And you do that using the bully puppet, and you use that doing legislation. What that should he have said? Answer. I think he needs to talk about specifics. Like, like what? What was the right answer? Let's talk about pay equity. We will not accept discrimination in the workforce. It means that we will end the absurdity of women in general making 80 cents on the dollar compared to men and minority women making a whole lot less than that. When we talk about minority communities, when we raise that federal minimum wage to a living wage of 15 bucks an hour, you're going to do away with a lot of economic stress in this country. Let's talk about discrimination. Let's talk about making sure that families, no matter where they are, no matter what color, have quality education. Every person in this country, regardless of color, regardless of income, has the right to get a higher education because we're going to make public colleges and universities tuition free. And we are going to very substantially end the burden of outrageous levels of student debt in this country. Access to affordable health care, all the other issues that Democrats it's, talk but he about, said, I and tailor it do everything I can to, to help constituency you're lead this to. country. And when we talk about justice, we are also talking about the massive levels of racial disparities that exist in this country. It's not just that we need health care for all people. We need to address the fact that infant mortality in the African-American community is two and a half times what it is in the white community. And it sounds like you're demanding he say the exact words that are in your head. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm demanding that he speak in more than platitudes. As President of the United States, I will appoint Supreme Court justices and nominate justices all across the board who will represent the needs of people of color, of working people, and who are prepared to believe and fight for justice, not just the people on top. But I think what we can do is something fairly novel, is that after a member of the Supreme Court serves for a certain period of time, perhaps 12 years or so, that that justice then rotates to an appeals court. Ooh. That'll give you some fresh blood.
Do you believe this country needs a constitutional amendment enshrining the rights of women? I do. The Don't political say it right. system in this country has has been the default. What do white men think? What do white working class men think? And now that we have more representation and the electorate, we're going to be a majority minority country in 2046. And so okay. now but, we actually have to have representation but, and, that reflect you, the you electorate assume, you're and assuming, talk about the issues and how they impact you're assuming people, people of color. My administration will look like America. Representatives from people who understand the pain and the struggle that working people and minorities are currently feeling. It will be an administration reflecting all of our people who are prepared to stand up for economic, social, and racial justice. Black he, people, he, he but pursued... unemployment is double white unemployment. And then within the midst of all of that income and wealth disparity at a national level, we have racial disparities as well. White families have 10 times the wealth of black families. Now, believe it or not, that video actually goes on longer. So I'm gonna link you to the full video by spitting back down below. I'd also encourage you to follow the people who put together that compilation because that really was phenomenal work. That was citizen journalism that really demonstrates how crucial it is in a mainstream media landscape that wouldn't necessarily do something like this. Now, to Bill Maher's credit, he actually kind of did push back against Zerlina Maxwell, but it really goes to show you that she's looking for reasons to criticize Bernie Sanders. She's not trying to be objective. She has a very specific goal. It is to bring down Bernie Sanders no matter what. Doesn't matter if I interpret him, you know, disingenuously. It doesn't matter if I smear him. I just want to defeat Bernie, and that is my number one goal. And I think it's really rich that, of all people, a former Clinton staffer said he should answer with more specificity and not just give off platitudes. You supported Hillary Clinton. You have no room to talk here. You don't have a single leg to stand on because your candidate, what was her uh, slogan again? I'm with her, stronger together. <laughs> Hillary had nothing but platitudes. She talked less about policy than other Democrats. So, I mean, how can you even say with a straight face that Bernie should lay off the platitudes when you supported Hillary Clinton and worked for her? Why would you want to be so brazenly hacky if your whole job as a journalist and as a political commentator is to maintain legitimacy so people take what you say seriously? Now, again, to be fair to Zerlina Maxwell, something she'd never do to Bernie, she was talking about things she would have liked in Bernie Sanders' answer about white supremacy. That specific question. But nonetheless, in a broader context, one of her criticisms about Bernie is he doesn't really address these key issues here that she was touching on. But throughout the course of what when she was criticizing Bernie, what the Spitting Back YouTube channel demonstrated with that compilation was that he has been talking about these things. People are so anti-Bernie that they are willing to lob Trumpian attacks against him, things that are easily debunkable if you just watch what Bernie Sanders said. Now, getting back to Bernie Sanders and him being booed, I'm not necessarily concerned with Bernie Sanders being booed because if he's booed, if the audience doesn't like what he has to say, then that just means that he's going to have to be more introspective and evolve based on what they said. Because back in 2016, when he was at the Netroots Nation conference and he was uh, shouted down, basically, when protesters wanted him to specifically say the names of women who were killed by police, I think that overall, that was a net benefit because it really helped Bernie Sanders to craft his message in a way that shows people that he's listening, that showed those Black Lives Matter protesters that he was taking what they had to say seriously. So even if, you know, if I were Bernie, I would want to bring up the fact that I marched with MLK every single day because that's such an amazing fact. I still can understand why people would say, look, you can't use that as a crutch. You need to talk about specific policies. But with that being said, um, he did talk about a lot of specific specific policies. Now, since we talked about, you know, this clip here where Bernie Sanders was booed and I criticized, you know, Zer Lena Maxwell for not necessarily, <laughs> I guess you can say, um, having a good faith description of what happened at that event, I'll just play you the full clip. I'll give you the full context so you can decide for yourself 
whether or not Bernie Sanders should have been booed. Overall, I think he probably should not have been booed. But nonetheless, towards the end here, you're going to see that he actually won over most of the audience after he kind of lost them because they wanted a specific answer and he wasn't answering to their liking and then he gave them a specific answer and then they liked what he had to say. So I'll leave you with the clip here that um, I think is important so you can decide for yourself um, and not get what political hacks want you to think happened out of this event. What do you believe is the federal government's role to fight against the rise of white nationalism and white terrorist acts? And how do you plan to lead on that in your first year as president? Okay. Thank you. First of all, but we have got to make it very clear that the type of demagoguery we are seeing from the Trump administration is not what this country is about. And I will do everything that I can to help lead this country in a direction that ends all forms of discrimination, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, and discrimination based on people's sexual orientation. I am the son of an immigrant, the proud son of an immigrant. And I will do everything that I can to make sure that we pass finally in this country comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship, that we provide immediate legal protection to the 1.8 million young people eligible for the DACA program. So the goal that we have got to establish is to bring our people together around an agenda that speaks to all people. And that means guaranteeing health care to every man, woman, and child as a right, not a privilege. And I'm proud to have led the effort to fight for a Medicare for all single-payer program. It means understanding that when we talk about minority communities, when we raise that federal minimum wage to a living wage of 15 bucks an hour, you're going to do away with a lot of economic stress in this country. So those are some of the things that I think we've got to and let do. Me, and let me just uh, yeah. follow up, Senator. I, the, the, uh, the, the, the core of the, the question is about, as president, what would you do with the rise of white supremacist violence right. to protect our communities? Absolutely. You know, as somebody who I, I know I date myself a little bit here, but I actually was at the March on Washington with Dr. King back in 1963. And as somebody who actively supported Jesse Jackson's campaign as one of the few white elected officials to do so in 88, I have dedicated my life to the fight against racism and sexism and discrimination of all forms. And as President of the United States, at the very top of our agenda will be the understanding that discrimination of all forms has got to end, period. And you do that using the bully puppet, and you use that doing legislation. If somebody wants to go around perpetrating hate crimes, that person will pay a very, very heavy price indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And I think what the questioner got, is getting at is a phenomenon that is actually global. We're seeing it throughout uh, Western Europe as well um, as, an, as influxes of immigrants from yes. uh, the Middle East right. come in. You're seeing the same kinds of rises of white nationalism. Um, well, let me just say a word uh, on that. That's correct. Yeah. So as president, what would you do to return Good. the U.S. to global leadership right. on that issue? Well, you reverse exactly what Trump is doing. Trump is a cowardly authoritarian president. who is trying, he hides the reality that he has tried to throw 30 plus million people off health care, give huge tax breaks to billionaires, cut Medicare, cut Medicaid, and education. You can't win an election doing that, so what do you do? You do what demagogues in Europe and in this country have always done. You scapegoat. You go after immigrants, you go after people of color, you go after minorities. You say those people are the problem. It's not Wall Street. It's not the drug companies, it's not the insurance companies, it is undocumented immigrants. That is demagoguery. You're right, it exists in this country, it exists all over the world. And as President of the United States, our foreign policy 
will not be as the current one is to support authoritarian bigots all over the country. It will be a policy of supporting democracy and human rights. Well, I think it's safe to say that the 2020 Democratic Party primary is starting to heat up because the gloves are now officially coming off. Because as you all know, last week, once Joe Biden announced that he's running for president, Elizabeth Warren was quick to point out that he sided with the credit card companies. And now Bernie Sanders is also contrasting his record with Joe Biden's. And, you know, there are people who are essentially begging candidates not to criticize each other. They're begging the base not to criticize the candidates. I'm talking about individuals like George Takai and Alyssa Milano. But you've got to understand that primaries are the place where we kind of have the candidates duke it out and they put their records up against everyone else's. Because if you don't do that, then you have a candidate that hasn't been properly vetted, that hasn't been tested, and you're making them weaker going into the general. And this idea that you can somehow weaken a candidate by criticizing them during a primary is completely flawed because as we all saw, every single Republican in 2016 was against Donald Trump. The Republican Party establishment was against Donald Trump. They had, you know, Mitt Romney come out to attack him and he won. Back in 2008, the primary between Obama and Hillary Clinton was extremely heated, and Obama went on to win. So just because Hillary Clinton lost after the primary in 2016 was extremely brutal doesn't mean that that is going to be the norm, because primaries are exactly where the candidates are supposed to duke it out. So people who are voting go into the voting booth making an educated decision, knowing where all of the candidates stand, who's strongest on this area and weakest on that area. This is what it's all about. So with that being said, Bernie Sanders was asked a very specific question about Joe Biden, and he took this opportunity to contrast his record with Joe Biden's. And essentially, he explained in a very polite way how abysmal Joe Biden's record is. Former Vice President Biden at his first campaign event today uh, was in front of Firefighters Union, obviously uh, critical organized labor is critical uh, support uh, in in a democratic primary. Are you concerned that that Biden can make inroads there? That Biden has a leg up there? Well, look, I'm running against I think 19 other people, so <laughs> I'm concerned about everybody. But I think when people take a look at my record uh, versus Vice President Biden's record, I helped lead the fight against NAFTA. He voted for NAFTA. I helped lead the fight against PNCR with China. He voted for it. I strongly oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He supported it. I voted against the war in Iraq. He voted for it. So I think what I hope, Anderson, what this campaign is about, and I got to tell you, I like Joe Biden. Joe is a friend of mine. But I think what we need to do with all of the candidates, have a issue-oriented campaign, not personal attacks, but talk about what we have done in our political lives, what we want to do as president, and how we're going to transform our economy so that it works for all of us and not just the 1%. So <laughs> I think that the number one thing that really stood out to me was how Bernie Sanders was choosing his words very carefully. Because back in 2016, all he did was call out Hillary Clinton's bad record. He didn't even want to talk about the more scandalous aspects about her campaign. He said, I'm tired of hearing about your damn emails because he really wanted to have a policy-based argument. But regardless, even if he didn't fully take the gloves off, and even though he obviously pulled punches, they accused him of essentially maligning her character for pointing out the objectively anti-progressive aspects of her record. So knowing that, you can tell how he's watching his words here and he's trying to go out of his way to be charitable to Joe Biden and say, look, I'm friends with Joe Biden. You know, we don't need to make this about personal attacks. Let's just look at each other's record. And you can tell that he knows he has to be extra cautious because the Democratic Party establishment is going to take anything he says that could possibly be construed as an attack and run with it and try to demonize him and try to say, oh, well, look, he's spoiling another primary. I mean, 
what was it, in January when David Brock wrote an article for NBC News saying we shouldn't let Bernie Sanders and his supporters spoil another Democratic primary, you know, as if they weren't the ones who were arbitrarily smearing Bernie Sanders and smearing his supporters as Bernie bros, and they're still doing it. So to me, the way that I view this is all of these pleas from people, maybe not necessarily celebrities, but more so from the establishment and pundit class, their pleas for candidates to not attack each other really is this implicit idea that they're trying to promote that really it's progressives that should unilaterally disarm. Because really, they're going to continue attacking Bernie, they're going to continue attacking his support base, but if we hit back, then they're going to say, see, I told you they were being aggressive. So I'm not going to fall for that, and I don't think the candidates should either, and I think that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders should go out of their way to draw comparisons between their records and the records of the other candidates because their records are just objectively better. And I actually wish Tulsi Gabbard would do this more as well. Like, I really would like to see her name drop the other candidates because I feel as if Tulsi Gabbard, she has the credibility that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren has. And when you're behind in the polls, one way that you kind of boost your name recognition, at least nationally, is you criticize the other candidates. So I think that if she took the gloves off as well, like Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, she could maybe benefit from that. So I really hope that she does that because... Tulsi Gabbard has an excellent case to be made as for why she's better than almost every single candidate running. Um, so with that being said, I do want to share a clip from a different interview with CNN that Bernie Sanders did. Now, what's interesting and I, what I want you to pay attention to is that in this clip, the CNN host is going to prime Bernie Sanders before he answers the, a question that she's going to ask him. So what she's going to do is she's going to show Bernie Sanders a poll. And then once he's primed to think about the polling results when responding, he's then going to be asked whether or not he should be focusing on the candidate's differences or who's best to beat Donald Trump. Now, the underlying reason why she showed you the poll in the first place is to get you to think, oh, well, Joe Biden has a pretty significant lead currently, and they're going to tacitly promote this idea that, look, Biden's the front runner, so should we really be comparing records? Should you really be talking about how shitty Joe Biden's record is if he's probably going to be the one to go up against Donald Trump? Shouldn't we be talking about who can beat Donald Trump? And essentially, what the host here is trying to promote and prime people to think about, even if it's in a very covert, insidious way, is why Bernie maybe shouldn't compare his record to Joe Biden's. But Bernie's going to reject that premise, and he's going to go on to do what he did in the last interview that you just saw with Anderson Goober. But what you're going to see here is that as he starts talking about how his record is just objectively better than Joe Biden's, the CNN host is then going to cut Bernie off and force him to be on the defensive. Um, and this really is clever because this is top-tier propaganda. This host is incredibly talented, so take a look. Senator, let me turn the page and just ask you about, I'm sure you've seen our new CNN poll out today. It shows yep. you and former Vice President Joe Biden as the front runners in this, this current race. And my question to you is, will your campaign be more about the contrast that you've clearly been drawing with Biden, or will it be more focused on who can best defeat President Trump? Well, I think both, to be honest with you. Look, uh, in my view, uh, Donald Trump is the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. He's a pathological liar. He's a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, a xenophobe. This is somebody who should not be president. I will do everything I can if I'm the Democratic nominee to defeat him, and I will support if I lose somebody else, whether it's Joe, whether it's somebody else. We're going to defeat uh, Donald Trump. But on the other hand, I think what I want to see in the Democratic primary is not you know, personal attacks or all, any of that stuff. What I want to see is an issue-oriented campaign. And Joe and I have very different pasts in terms of how we have voted and very different vision for the future. And that is something that we should be discussing. For example, all right, I voted against the war in Iraq. In fact, helped lead the opposition to what turned out to be the worst foreign policy disaster in the modern history of America. Joe voted for it. I voted against a NAFTA. Uh, I voted against permanent normal trade relations with China, two trade agreements which cost us millions of good paying jobs. Joe supported those agreements. I voted against the deregulation 
of Wall Street. Uh, Joe supported that legislation, which I think, you know, many people agree with me, some don't, led to the Wall Street collapse of 2008. Senator, um, let me jump in because I, I hear you on the on the contrast, and there are a number of them. But the one thing that both of you voted for, and what what Joe Biden helped write, is the 1994 crime bill. Uh, even former President Bill Clinton, who signed it into law, says it went too far. Right? It, it expanded right. mandatory minimums. It boosted the right, nation's right, prison absolutely. population. It, it disproportionately impacted African Americans yes. and Hispanics. So my yes. question to you, Senator Sanders, is: Do you regret? that well vote. let me give you my answer go to YouTube today and find out what I said literally well, I'm on looking the day at you right now Senator it. tell me but, if you but, one it. second I voted for that bill because it included the violence against women's act and it included a ban on assault weapons and Brooke you would be asking me today Senator, why did you not vote for a ban on assault weapons? Why did you vote against I'm asking you the, today uh, if you regret your vote. What I Sometimes you have legislation which includes very good stuff and very bad stuff. That legislation included very bad stuff. I had to make the choice whether I voted to ban assault weapons, something that I promised the people of Vermont I would. And I also had to vote to make sure that we had a violence against women provision in there. If you see what I said on the floor at that time, I talked about mass incarceration. I talked about capital punishment. So sometimes in the real world, in the Congress, you got big pieces of legislation that have bad stuff, and God knows that legislation had bad stuff. And right now, I'm one of the leaders in the fight for criminal justice reform, so we don't have more people in jail than any other major country on earth. So, look, I've got to give the CNN host credit there, not in a good way, but in a bad way. She is a very clever and talented propagandist because she saw that Bernie Sanders didn't take the bait that she put out for him, essentially saying, look, shouldn't we focus on beating Donald Trump and who's most qualified to take on Donald Trump. And essentially, Bernie, shouldn't you shut up about how bad Biden's record is? But he chose to just talk about how his record is better than Joe Biden's record. And what does she do? She cuts him off and backs Bernie into a corner and forces him to defend himself. Because what Bernie was doing was he was explaining things that Joe Biden needs to answer for essentially putting Joe Biden on the defensive. And then what did that host do? She swooped in, saved Biden, cut Bernie off, and made Bernie explain himself. Now, you can see that this wasn't extremely brazen because the host also tried to pretend as if she was trying to be fair. Bernie, you voted for the crime bill, as did Joe Biden. In fact, he wrote the crime bill, but you voted for the crime bill. This led to mass incarceration. Explain yourself. And then Bernie, of course, had to explain himself. And I'm not going to say Bernie shouldn't explain himself here, but if you do go back to the YouTube videos and look at what he was saying back then, he was not defending the crime bill. In fact, Bernie Sanders was sounding the alarm. But the reason why Bernie Sanders voted for the crime bill, as he stated in that video, is because it included provisions that banned assault weapons and also included, you know, um, protections for violence against women. Now, as Bernie pointed out there, cleverly so, is that if he didn't vote for the crime bill, then the host would be asking, well, why did you vote against this provision that banned violence against women? Why are you so pro-gun, Bernie? So I think that Bernie Sanders is understanding what's happening here in real time as she's posing these biased questions but you've got to understand here and really i wish that the hosts here would educate viewers more sometimes when you have a piece of legislation that isn't necessarily popular or supported by the entirety of your caucus what you need to do is you need to put things in that bill that would lure people who are reluctant to support it in so bernie sanders did not support the crime bill it was introduced twice remember back in 1991 and 1994 but he sounded the alarms both times so what did they do to get it passed in 1994 once it couldn't muster enough support back in 1991 they included provisions that would lure people like bernie sanders in the violence against women provision the clause to ban assault weapons and this is actually a really clever legislative tactic because if you want your legislation to pick up steam and some people are vocalizing concerns well if you're not willing to amend that bill to kind of appease their concerns what you can do is take issues that they care about and include it in that bill 
to kind of get them on board. And that's exactly what Joe Biden cleverly did, to his credit. And that's why Bernie Sanders voted for the crime bill. Now, that doesn't excuse Bernie's vote, of course. He still needs to explain. There's still room for nuance here. But with that being said, just take a step back and acknowledge what that CNN host did. It was brilliant. Credit to her for being an amazing propagandist. She disarmed Bernie's argument against Joe Biden's past and made him defend his own past. That's just good propaganda. <laughs> I mean, um, it's it's really disingenuous, but nonetheless, you know, Bernie Sanders really had no choice but to defend his record there. So look, at the end of the day, it's important for candidates to draw these contrasts between each other. And I've always maintained that we don't need to lob these ad hominem attacks at the candidates. They shouldn't resort to character attacks on each other. And it really didn't go that far back in 2016, in spite of what people will say. Now, people will accuse Bernie Sanders supporters of maligning Hillary Clinton's character because we said that, that she was corrupt. But this was based on the facts. There were numerous instances where she took money from a particular special interest and then did their bidding. That's corruption. So, of course, we should avoid personal attacks. We shouldn't critique someone for their personality. But in the event, there are real differences between the candidates. Unquestionably, you should call them out. So, Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are right here. And anyone who says otherwise are wrong. I hope that Elizabeth, or not Elizabeth Warren, but Tulsi Gabbard joins them because she also has a great record um, for the most part that she can put up against other people and possibly um, climb a little bit in the polls if she actually utilized this same strategy. Because I think that Elizabeth Warren's people know and political scientists in general know that if you're behind in the polls, what do you do? You attack the front runner. And since Bernie and Warren are both kind of behind in the polls, you attack the the front runner, or not necessarily attack, that's too strong of a word, but you point out differences between their record and your record. It's why before Biden announced, Pete Buttigieg was attacking Bernie Sanders because he was the front runner. So I hope that candidates who I like, namely Tulsi Gabbard, also replicate this strategy because I think it could help her in terms of name recognition and get her numbers up. So as you all know, last week, Bernie Sanders took a pretty bad beating from the press and from the GOP, namely because of his position on voting rights and his belief that felons should be allowed to vote while they're still incarcerated. Now, is his position the morally justifiable one? Absolutely. However, I do think it's important for us to admit that it's still a politically toxic position to take in a media landscape where pretty much every unpopular opinion will be susceptible to sensationalism and smear attacks. Now, we saw what happened at the CNN Town Hall. He was asked if his position on universal suffrage would extend to people like the Boston Bomber, which the media obviously had a field day with because they tried to make it seem as if Bernie Sanders was specifically advocating for this position because he had some weird affinity for the Boston Bomber. But, I mean, we all know, as supporters of Bernie Sanders, he didn't take this position originally because he loves the Boston Bomber and he loves psychopaths. He took this position because he sees how racially biased our criminal justice system is and how disenfranchising felons is just one of many ways that our system disenfranchises black and brown Americans. And by agreeing that felons should be allowed to vote, you're acknowledging that black and brown people are affected the most by mass incarceration in our nation's prison industrial complex. So by advocating for this position, you're sensitive to institutional racism and the reality of how our system works and how it specifically targets people of color. However, with that being said, um, just objectively speaking, I don't think Bernie Sanders answered that question in an ideal way. However, it's been about a week. He's had some time to think about it, and he's had a little bit of time to mull over how he's going to try to reclaim this narrative away from the GOP and away from the mainstream media. And he came up with something that I've got to give him credit for. It's pretty damn clever. So here's what he's doing to take back the narrative. In an op-ed for USA Today, Bernie Sanders writes, Everyone deserves the right to vote, even felons like Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen. Now, before we get to the article here, just take a moment and think about how clever that is. 
we're no longer talking about voting rights in terms of the Boston bomber. We're talking about voting rights in terms of allowing Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen to vote. Now, is this really the conversation that Bernie Sanders wants to be having? Of course not, because he wants to talk about the real reason why we should allow felons to vote. It's because this is an issue related to criminal justice and institutional racism. But with that being said, if Republicans are going to play this game where they try to straw man Bernie Sanders and make it seem as if he specifically wants felons to be allowed to vote just so the Boston bomber can be allowed to vote, well, now he's forcing them to acknowledge that this isn't really about the Boston bomber. This is just about being principled in my stand that people should be allowed to vote. So Republicans, do you not think that Michael uh, Cohen and Paul Manafort should be allowed to vote? I like it. Now, when you actually dive into the article itself, he is a lot more nuanced. And here's what he writes. I have been attacked in recent days by President Trump and others for my conviction that people who are incarcerated should be given the right to vote. I make no apologies for that position. Our country has had a long and shameful history of voter suppression. At our founding, despite rhetoric to the contrary, only land-owning white males were given the right to participate in our democracy. Lower-income people, women, Native Americans, African Americans, and young people were excluded. We have been engaged in an ongoing 243-year project to expand participation in our democracy. Thankfully, we have made much progress in that struggle, but our work is not done, not even close. If we are serious about calling ourselves a democracy, we must firmly establish that the right to vote is an inalienable and universal principle that applies to all American citizens 18 years and older, period. As American citizens, all of us are entitled to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and all other freedoms enshrined in our Bill of Rights. We are also entitled to vote. Yes, even if Trump's former campaign manager and personal lawyer end up in jail, they should still be able to vote regardless of who they cast their vote for. Indeed, our present-day crisis of mass incarceration has become a tool of voter suppression. Today, over 4.5 million Americans, disproportionately people of color, have lost their right to vote because they have served time in jail or prison for a felony conviction. It goes without saying that someone who commits a serious crime must pay his or her debt to society, but punishment for a crime or keeping dangerous people behind bars must not cause people to lose their rights to citizenship. It should not cause them to lose their right to vote. This should not devolve into a debate about whether certain people are, quote, good enough to have the right to vote. Voting is not a privilege, it is a right. In my view, the crooks on Wall Street who caused the Great Recession of 2008 that hurt millions of Americans are not good people, but they have the right to vote and it should never be taken away. The reason why this issue is so important right now is that Trump and cowardly Republican politicians all over this country are working overtime to suppress the vote. Instead of trying to increase voter turnout, they are making it harder for people to participate in the political process. In Florida, the Republican legislature is trying to undermine the will of 64% of people who voted to reenfranchise formerly incarcerated people. In Georgia, we have a Republican governor who took office by instituting barriers to voting for people of color. In Tennessee, the Republican legislature is trying to shut down groups who do voter registration work. In New Hampshire and Iowa, the Republicans have tried to make it harder for college students to vote. The point here is simple. At a time when voting suppression is taking place all across the country, we must make it clear that casting a ballot for American citizens is not a privilege. It is a right. If you're an American citizen who is 18 years or older, you must be able to vote, whether you're in jail or not. So I think that this op-ed does a number of things. First of all, it shifts the conversation away from the Boston bomber and onto a more nuanced conversation. And really, he name drops Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen specifically. So we're talking about them as opposed to the Boston Bomber, but once he kind of ropes you in with that catchy title, then he goes on to explain in a very detailed and thorough way why we need to allow felons the right to vote, people to vote in prison. If you truly believe this is an inalienable right, then we should extend suffrage 
universally. Now, also what this does, which I think is important, is it disarms this Republican line of attack against him that he only wants people in prison to be allowed to vote because they're most likely to vote for Democrats. What he's saying here is, no, look, even people like Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen, who obviously wouldn't vote for me, they'd vote for Donald Trump. We should let them vote too because this isn't about who they're going to vote for. This is about the principle of democracy. And I love how Republicans completely miss the irony because as they institute all of these arbitrary, racist, quite frankly, voter ID laws, they're doing that specifically to decrease voter turnout. They are creating barriers to voting so that way people don't turn out as much and poor people of color don't come out to vote, and those people are overwhelmingly likely to vote for Democrats. So they're essentially projecting. They're saying that Bernie is trying to tweak the voting laws to give himself the edge when that's what they do all the time. So I think that this was a really important article for Bernie Sanders to write, and even if it may not be the perfect solution to get the media and Republicans off of his back, I can tell that it kind of worked, and I'll tell you why I think it worked. So in an interview on CNN, which was a pretty combative interview for the most part if you watch the whole thing, you can see that the way that the CNN host questioned him here was very different. It was no longer about, you know, trying to get Bernie to explain why he thinks the Boston bomber should be allowed to vote. So I'm going to play that clip for you and also take note of the quick jab that Bernie throws in against media here. Check Speaking my record of jail. Out. Speaking of jail, speaking of incarceration, I read your opinion piece. I mean, today yes. you wrote this opinion piece, USA Today, everyone can go read it, uh, on why you think felons deserve the right to vote. And you point out in the in, in middle part through the piece that, that over 4.5 million Americans, disproportionately people of color, have lost their right to vote because they've served time. And, and so, Senator, on this, on this issue, only 28% of Democrats or Democratic leaners say that this is very important to them, uh, that the candidate that they support take this position. And I just wanted to ask you, why is this so important well, to you I, and your campaign? Well, Brooke, I think you know how politics works. I was asked that as, in a question. In fact, I didn't come up with it. It was asked the question, I gave an answer. And I think we should do what Canada does, what Israel does, what many countries around the world do. And that is to separate. If somebody commits a serious crime, they're going to go to jail. And if they're violent people, they may spend the rest of their lives in jail. That's the way it is. You pay a price when you commit a crime. But this is what I believe. At a time when the Republican Party and Donald Trump are working overtime to suppress the vote, to make it harder for people of color, poor people, young people to vote, we have got to make it clear, in my view, that if you are an American citizen, even if you do something terrible, even if you're a bad person, we cannot take away your right to vote, whether you're in jail or whether you left jail. Clearly, what Republicans are doing is trying to deny people of color the right to vote, and this is an issue I think we have to address head on. So even if you are in jail, even in my Democrats view, disagree with you. I mean, you I'm well, sure fine. saw what Look, Cory Booker of the said. Things, yeah, well, let me say this, Brooke. Four years ago, people disagreed with me on Medicare for all, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, criminal justice reform, spending a trillion dollars on rebuilding our infrastructure. People disagreed with me. They'll disagree with me now. But you know what? I will tell you what I think. And that is, if you're a citizen of this country, you have the right to vote. And I will oppose all efforts to try to deny Americans the right to participate in our democracy. Okay. So now they're essentially objecting to this position that Bernie Sanders is taking because it's not popular. So the line of attack has shifted, which tells me that Bernie Sanders' op-ed here accomplished what he hoped it would accomplish, at least, you know, thus far, judging by this one anecdote. But what I find interesting is that just above allowing felons the right to vote is reparations in terms of one of two least popular issues among the Democratic Party's base. But just a couple of months ago, they were attacking Bernie because he didn't come out in favor of reparations. But now they're attacking him because he's taking the position of a policy that's not popular. But back then, they were attacking him because he didn't come out in favor of a policy that's obviously not very popular. So do you understand? What this tells me is that they're not going to stop attacking Bernie Sanders. He's never going to silence all of their criticism. It's just going to change. They're going to be able to adapt. And it doesn't matter what Bernie Sanders does or doesn't do throughout the course of this campaign because they're going to attack him regardless because their goal isn't to educate voters. It's to take down Bernie Sanders and sabotage his campaign at all costs. But nonetheless, the point of 
getting his critics to shut up about the Boston Bomber was really important. And I think that that, you know, it, it demonstrated the success of his op-ed here. However, notice the jab that he took at the CNN host because this was never really Bernie Sanders' most salient issue because just strategically speaking, you never want to prop up the policies that you have that you know aren't very popular. You kind of endorse those ideas or you state your position on those ideas, but you kind of put them on the back burner and you promote the ideas that you know are more popular. That's just good politics. But he took a jab at the CNN host because he said, look, you know how politics works. I was asked about this and I responded to this question. I just answered truthfully. And now you all are trying to make it seem this isn't him saying this, but this is the point he was trying to get across. Now you're trying to make it seem as if I'm going to die on this hill. I support this position, but my entire campaign is based on universal redistributive policies that would help the middle class survive and fix the country and unrig the economy and unrig, you know, our racist criminal justice system. So by and large, I hope that this at least at a minimum puts a cap on some of the criticism and hate Bernie was receiving with regard to this issue, but we'll have to wait and see. Either way, you know, as I stated, they're not going to stop criticizing him. They're just going to adapt. Their critiques and smears are going to evolve with time. And as I've stated before, they're just going to move on to something else if they think it's going to be more effective at bringing down his numbers. Um, and we're going to see this continuously throughout the course of his campaign. So I think you guys all know how I personally feel about Mayor Pete. I am not a fan. I don't think he's the worst candidate ever, but for the most part, I think he's just another centrist neoliberal who's trying to convince Democratic Party primary voters that he's more progressive than he actually is. However, whenever I criticize Pete Buttigieg, it's always based on policy substance. If I disagree with him, it's specifically because he either supports or does not support a policy I want him to support. However, Republicans seemingly believe he is a huge threat, and as a result, they have targeted him lately. Now, because Republicans have zero policy substance whatsoever, they can't actually lob a thoughtful criticism at Pete Buttigieg. So instead, how are they choosing to uh, criticize him and try to bring him down? Like this. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the good news is the condition of my soul is in the hands of God, but the Iowa caucuses are up to you. Yeah. I mean, I think that Pete handled that really well. I would probably be a lot more rude to that idiot. And, you know, it's not just this one heckler who's a standout. There are other Republicans who are relatively prominent in the realm of politics, who are using the same homophobic line of attack against Pete Buttigieg. For example, Franklin Graham vocalized his disgust with the fact that the first prominent gay presidential candidate uh, exists. He tweeted out, Mayor Buttigieg says he's a gay Christian. As a Christian, I believe the Bible, which defines homosexuality as sin, something to be repentant of, not something to be flaunted, praised, or politicized. The Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman, not two men, not two women. Oh, okay, well, thank you so much, Franklin. I'm sure that that's the first time Pete has heard that before. But since you told him that the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman, not a man and a man or a woman and a woman... That's totally going to change his mind now. He's never heard that before, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, these people are so fucking stupid. They're so stupid. Because you have this superstitious, morally bankrupt, holy book that you abide by, you believe that we should all acquiesce and follow your beliefs. But we reject your religion. I don't accept your religion. I don't subscribe to the holy book that you follow. I'm an atheist. But if you actually want to live in a country where the government imposes its homophobic views on its citizens, there's no shortage of countries you can move to. You can go to Saudi Arabia, Franklin Graham, where they have the same views as you have about homosexuality, and they kill people. 
for being gay. So if you don't like that gay people exist and they're now running for president and they're fighting for equality, move to Saudi Arabia. So do you understand, like, you would think that we've reached this state in America where, you know, somebody can run for president who's gay and we don't really focus on that. We focus on the policy substance, but people are still very homophobic. You could have asked any gay person, they, they would have still told you that, but it's a little bit disheartening to see that homophobia is still flaunted in such an open way. It's a little bit soul crushing, you know, I'm not going to lie about that. Now, on top of the brazen homophobia and bigotry that Pete Buttigieg is putting up with, well, there's another line of attack that Republicans are using, not necessarily the Republican Party, but individuals who are pro-Republican, people in the realm of politics. And I'm talking about Jacob Wool, who is perhaps the GOP's most notorious and dumbest smear merchant, who not only attempted to lob false sexual assault allegations against Robert Mueller, but he also faked death threats against himself, and he's now turned his attention to Mayor Pete. And what is he doing? Well, he's trying to fabricate false sexual assault allegations against Pete Buttigieg. I mean, how disgusting and morally reprehensible of a person do you have to be to make up this claim of sexual assault, which you know could ruin someone's life, but you don't like them, so fuck them. And this all kind of started when on Monday there was this Medium post that mysteriously appeared where somebody claims that Mayor Pete Buttigieg had sexually assaulted them. Now, I saw this and my bullshit detector went off immediately because anytime you see something like this that isn't vetted by a real journalist that just seemingly appears out of nowhere by this new account, the red flags in your mind should be going off. So I think most people smelled the bullshit here from a mile away. And what was later revealed by the Daily Beast, who managed to uncover what was going on, was that this was all part of a larger coordinated effort to smear Pete Buttigieg in the most disgusting way imaginable. So as the Daily Beast's Lachlan Marquet, Kevin Polson, and Noah Schottman explains, a pair of right-wing provocateurs are being accused of attempting to recruit young Republican men to level false allegations of sexual assault against Democratic presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg. The details of the operative's attempt emerged as one man suddenly surfaced with a vague and uncooperated allegation that Buttigieg had assaulted him. The claim was retracted hours later. A Republican source told the Daily Beast that lobbyist Jack Berkman and internet troll Jacob Wohl approached him last week to try to convince him to falsely accuse Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, of engaging him sexually while he was too drunk to consent. The source, who spoke to the Daily Beast, said Berkman and Wohl made clear that their goal was to kneecap Buttigieg's momentum in the 2020 presidential race. The men asked to remain anonymous out of a concern that the resulting publicity might imperil his employment and because he said Wohl and Berkman have a reputation for vindictiveness. But the source provided the Daily Beast with a surreptitious audio recording of a meeting which corroborates his account. In it, Wohl appears to refer to Buttigieg as a term threat to President Trump's re-election next year. On Monday, a separate individual using the name of Hunter Kelly published a post on the site Medium in which he alleged that Buttigieg sexually assaulted him in February. That post was tweeted out by David Wohl, Jacob's father, and quickly rewritten by the site Big League Politics, which is known as a landing ground for right-wing conspiracy theories. Kelly's supposed Medium and Twitter accounts both say they were created this month. His Facebook page included several posts lauding Trump and criticizing Hillary Clinton. He appears to have responded to Jacob Wohl's posts on Instagram in the past. The Daily Beast reached out to Kelly on a cell phone listed to him in the student directory at his Michigan college, told we were reporting on apparent efforts by Jacob Wohl and Jack Berkman to drum up false sexual assault allegations against Buttigieg. Kelly replied, I was unaware this was happening, but yes, it is true. Kelly wrote that he did not control the newly created Medium and Twitter accounts that posted the allegations under his name. When asked if he could verify his identity, he texted the Daily Beast a 
selfie that matched the photo seen on Medium and on Kelly's long-standing Facebook accounts. Here is a selfie of me. Sorry, I have been crying, he wrote. Today and the promises made didn't go as planned. Kelly declined to provide more details, but two hours later, he posted a message on his Facebook timeline headed, I was not sexually assaulted. So the guy who originally made that Medium post accusing Pete Buttigieg of sexually assaulting him claimed that that wasn't actually him who wrote it, and it was this gigantic debacle, and it's another fabricated sexual assault case that blew up in Jacob Wall's face. And this isn't the first time he's just fabricated stories out of thin air because him and one of his colleagues, Laura Loomer, is relentlessly pushing this story that is not corroborated by anyone about how Ilhan Omar came to America by marrying her brother. So this guy is nothing more than a notorious smear merchant and he needs to be prosecuted for this. Like, these are claims that he's leveling against people that can ruin their lives. This can ruin their lives. And the GOP, if you'll recall, they were screeching at the top of their lungs back in November when we were vetting serious allegations against then Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Well, as you can see here, if they're false, they often don't pan out. And the people who are creating these false allegations are often discovered. But for Republicans to come out and be so worried about false allegations, are they going to condemn Jacob Wall here? And it wasn't just big league politics who um, reported on this. There were other right-wing websites that did the same. Infowars, unsurprisingly, picked up the Medium post. So, I mean, think about this. Think about how bad this is and how this is journalistic malpractice to just report on a medium post that hasn't been vetted, hasn't been corroborated by any witnesses. This is horrible, yellow journalism, and any outlet that reports on something like this should absolutely be permanently discredited because evidence is important. But as we can see here, um, this is what the... Uh, first gay presidential candidate has to deal with um, homophobia, brazen homophobia, and false claims of sexual assault. It is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Now, to be fair, I don't think, you know, just because Pete Buttigieg is gay that Jacob Wall decided to fabricate this sexual assault claim against him. I think he'd probably do this to anyone who he thought posed a threat against Donald Trump. But with that being said, you know, it makes these claims a little bit easier to be believed because what are some of the stereotypes about gay men? They're overly promiscuous. They're always sleeping around. And it doesn't matter that Pete Buttigieg is a married gay man. You know, this is believable because our society believes, you know, these default homophobic narratives that a gay man is perfectly capable of um, not only cheating on his husband, but sexually assaulting someone. Because they're all just a bunch of horn dogs, you know, going around and screwing anything with legs. It is morally reprehensible. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to criticize Pete Buttigieg, then you can do so by not completely impugning his character in the most disgusting fucking way possible. So this is absolutely disgusting. And I, I, I'm honestly speechless. I mean, it's not surprising, but it's really, it's still grotesque. And it really is jarring to see how dirty Republicans are willing to get. Now, again, this isn't necessarily the GOP itself, but it is a smear merchant who does propaganda for the GOP and is willing to do anything, go to any length to defeat anyone deemed a threat to the Holy One, Donald Trump. So here's the note that I'll end on. It's time for Jacob Wool to be prosecuted because these false accusations these are crimes so prosecute him and throw his ass in jail if he's going to keep doing this because it's not like this is the first time he was caught doing this like this is a criminal who is lobbing very serious accusations against political opponents of his that could ruin their lives and there needs to be some accountability so he should be investigated and ultimately he should be prosecuted because 
This is completely unacceptable. I wouldn't support this against Donald Trump if there were false allegations. I would just challenge someone based on the policy substance. And if you can't defeat that person based on the substance itself, then too bad. That's politics. Try again. But to stoop to this level, you know, this is gutter politics and it's grotesque. Joe Biden's been in the race now for a little over a week, and he's finally starting to give us some insight into his current foreign policy positions. And as pretty much all of us would expect, it's a mixed bag. So there's some good, but there's also some bad, some really bad. So we'll get to the good first when it comes to the issue of U.S. support for the Saudi-led genocide in Yemen. He has come out against that. And as Zach Budrick of The Hill reports, former Vice President Joe Biden, a 2020 Democratic presidential candidate, is calling for an end to U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's military campaign in Yemen as part of his first major policy proposals released since launching his campaign. Vice President Biden believes it is past time to end U.S. support for the war in Yemen and cancel the blank check the Trump administration has given Saudi Arabia for its conduct of that war. Biden campaign spokesman Andrew Bates told the Washington Post's Josh Rogan he urges Congress to override President Trump's veto. All right, so credit where it's due. This is the correct position to take. However, this is the position I would expect anyone running in the Democratic Party primary to take because this really isn't a difficult issue. If you arrive at the opposite conclusion, then there's something wrong with you. I mean, even Tea Party Republican Mike Lee agrees that we should end U.S. complicity in Saudi Arabia's genocide in Yemen. So if a Democratic presidential candidate didn't come to a solution that's such a no-brainer that even a Tea Party Republican can see it, it would be really bad for Joe Biden. We'll just say that. However, since this is an easy issue and I'm still willing to give him credit, the real question is, how is he going to respond to more complex issues? Issues like Venezuela. Because as we all know, Joe Biden is someone who has done the bidding of the military industrial complex. He aligned with neocons throughout the course of his career. I mean, he voted for the Iraq war. His administration turned Libya into a failed state functionally. Him and Obama increased Bush's drone war. So is he going to be able to resist his interventionist instincts when it comes to the issue of Venezuela? Did he learn his lesson? Is he going to come out against Donald Trump here and what him, Elliot Abrams, Mike Pompeo, and John Bolton are trying to do? Well, the answer, disappointingly, is no, because Joe Biden tweeted this out. The violence in Venezuela today against peaceful protesters is criminal. Maduro's regime is responsible for incredible suffering. The U.S. must stand with the National Assembly and Guaido in their efforts to restore democracy through legitimate internationally monitored elections. So what he said there is relatively vague, and because he spoke in coded language, I think a lot of people might see or might not see rather why what he said there is problematic but let me break it down for you there he essentially just signaled support for the u.s coup in venezuela he's functionally taking the side of donald trump here and his position is incredibly ironic i don't think he realizes this because you're essentially saying i'm against maduro because he is an illegitimate leader. He was not elected democratically, but let's side with this person who also wasn't elected. Now, he didn't go so far as to recognize Guaido as the president like Donald Trump did, but, I mean, this is essentially a wink and a nod to Guaido, and it legitimizes Donald Trump's regime change effort currently. So this is a horribly troubling indication of what's to come for someone who, again, has been very interventionist in the past. The correct answer and the only answer here is to stop meddling in Venezuela. Full stop. Leave them alone. Mind your own business because U.S. leaders don't know what to do to not royally fuck up other countries. I mean, we've already did enough. For those of you who don't know, both Bush and Obama, and now Donald Trump, obviously, they wanted Venezuela to play ball with them. They wanted access 
to Venezuela's oil reserves. So the U.S. has for years now been trying to find ways to undermine Venezuela to get access to that oil. And once Maduro came to power after Hugo Chavez passed away, well, the United States government thought that this would be an opportunity. Maybe Maduro would be a puppet like other countries are with huge reserves of oil. But Maduro, like his predecessor, didn't want to play ball. So what the U.S. did was they aligned with Saudi Arabia and Israel to destabilize Venezuela since normal diplomatic relationships wasn't possible since they didn't trust us and rightfully so I think but what we did was we worked with Saudi Arabia and Israel to artificially drive down the price of oil and since Venezuela I think stupidly so didn't diversify their economy and their entire economy essentially was propped up by oil revenue what happened after that? Well, they were forced to compete, which ultimately led to a loss of revenue. And since their economy was not diversified, well, of course, this led to economic issues, which subsequently led to political destabilization. And once we sowed the seeds that ultimately catalyzed political instability, we then placed sanctions on them to punish them for their response to said instability that we tried to cause in the first place. And now we're looking for any excuse possible to invade and we have john bolton on national television admit that you know it'd be really great if we could get in there and um have access to venezuela's oil reserves if american companies can get in there this can be a benefit for us and venezuela so this has always been about oil and yes i acknowledge that that explanation is an oversimplification but for the most part we're not worried about what's happening in Venezuela because we have humanitarian impulses. We're worried about Venezuela because we see that as a potential revenue source for us because we want their oil. That's what it's about. This is what it's about a lot of the times. I mean, we are in Afghanistan because we want access to their minerals. We intervene in countries because we want what they have. And if they don't play ball with us, if we don't have a puppet in there to do our bidding, then oftentimes we'll overthrow their entire regime to put in someone who's going to play ball with us. It's really disgusting. And what I am worried about is Joe Biden is now essentially legitimizing Donald Trump's regime change efforts. And what's worrying is that this is someone who's one of the front runners. He could actually win. So if Joe Biden wins... If he becomes the Democratic Party nominee, once again, like in 2016, you have the choice between a warmonger and another warmonger. And as Glenn Greenwald points out, wouldn't it be ironic if Democrats, after spending three years indignantly protesting, quote, meddling by foreign countries in our internal affairs, end up marching behind the person who said this in 2002 about why he supports Bush and Cheney removing Iraq's government? And he linked to a video of Joe Biden saying this about the Iraq war and his support for it. Considered in the context of the president's speech this week and his address last month to the United Nations General Assembly, this resolution, though still imperfect, deserves our support. And let me explain why. First, the objective is more clearly and carefully stated. The objective is to compel Iraq to destroy its illegal weapons of mass destruction and its programs to develop and produce missiles and more of those weapons. President Bush did not lash out precipitously at Iraq after 9-11. He did not snub the UN or our allies. He did not dismiss new inspection regimes. He did not ignore Congress. At each pivotal moment, he has chosen a course of moderation and deliberation. And I believe he will continue to do so. At least that is my fervent hope. I wish he would turn down the rhetorical excess in some cases, because I think it undercuts the decision he ends up making. But in each case, in my view, he has made the right, rational, and calm, deliberate decision. So as you can see, Joe Biden has a very troubling history. And for whatever reason, he couldn't see through the bullshit. Other people, like Bernie Sanders and Barbara Lee, realized what George Bush was doing, essentially lying his way into a war, and Joe Biden didn't see it. And now we can see him in real time gravitate towards making the wrong decision once again.
Now, he elaborated a little bit more on his position with regard to Venezuela, but for the most part, it was pretty much word salad. But let me play you a clip about him talking about this a little bit more. Look, I, I've been talking to my foreign policy team back uh, uh, home in Washington. I've not seen anything. I think what I understand so far is that uh, Guado and Lopez, and I've spent time with his wife when he was in jail, um, is, uh, um, I think we, I think the anticipation that there was going to be a military rise up uh, has been slightly uh, um, underestimated. And uh, I think what we have to continue to do is make it real clear. That's ridiculous talking about foreign policy and my ice cream right here. <laughs> but um, I think that it's very important we stay calm here. And uh, what, uh, what I think the, it, it ultimately what's required is for the international community to demand that there be free elections. There's only one democratic election that's taking place in that place, and it's for the assembly. They're the people who were actually democratic elected. Maduro was not democratically elected. And there's got to be a commitment that there be, we hold democratic elections. And that's why it's important we continue to maintain, maintain and increase the confidence that the rest of Latin and South America has in our judgment. And we got to pull people together because I think that's the only way this works without there being some real serious problems. Now, that was incredibly difficult to follow, but you can really see that his thoughts there were scattered. He wasn't prepared to answer that question clearly. But if you could take anything away from that, you can see that he says, look, Maduro is illegitimate. He was not democratically elected. But yet, ironically, you're kind of signaling support for Donald Trump's position, which is to recognize someone as president who also was not democratically elected. Now, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, Maduro really was the authoritarian dictator that they say he is. So is that the new standard that we want to create? We meddle and intervene in countries that aren't democratically elected? Because if that's the new standard, then we're going to have to intervene in Russia. We're going to have to in intervene in Saudi Arabia. We're essentially going to have to intervene and every single country under the guise of making them more democratic. Do you see the issue with that here? Do you see why, logistically speaking, that is a fool's game? Are we going to invade North Korea and democratize them? Are we going to invade Morocco and overthrow the king? And rather than focusing on our own issues here, rather than focusing on the fact that maybe America isn't the most democratic country in the world, the person who got the most votes is not the president. Someone in Georgia literally was able to control his own election. He was secretary of state. He put up various barriers to voting and he won narrowly because he cheated. Maybe if you're worried about democracy, look at what's happening here in America. But Joe Biden, he just has the worst instincts imaginable and he does not have the best judgment. And this was a huge issue that Hillary Clinton had back in 2016 and why progressives couldn't get on board with her campaign because she was too hawkish. And Joe Biden obviously has the same problem. And by really giving a wink and a nod to Guaido and signaling support for Donald Trump's efforts here, what you are championing is U.S. interference in Venezuela that has essentially devolved into this proxy war between the United States and Russia. So are you going to continue to fan the flames of regime change knowing that you've been wrong before, knowing that this is now a proxy war and that we don't need to escalate the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia? I mean, Imagine how damaging it would be if Joe Biden became the nominee. Everybody is talking about electability and how he's the best bet to go up against Donald Trump. But we got someone in 2016 who was overly hawkish, who was basically on the wrong side of every U.S. interventionist issue. So do we really want to make that mistake again, people? Really? Where we give individuals the choice between a warmonger and a warmonger? I mean, are, are we crazy? Do we really want to see what would happen if we did the same thing again, if we made the same exact mistake, I mean, we have to learn our lesson, people. And if you're against regime change wars, then you have to be consistent and you have to acknowledge that there are three people who we can trust here. Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, and Elizabeth Warren. And to her credit, Tulsi Gabbard has absolutely been the strongest 
in this regard. She's not only spoken out against the new Cold War, but she's also been the most forceful in speaking out against the United States' regime change efforts in Venezuela. So, for the love of God, people, if we don't want a repeat of 2016, don't vote for Joe Biden. Vote for someone who actually is going to provide voters with an alternative in 2020. That obviously is not Joe Biden, because if he's siding with Donald Trump on a key issue here, there's going to be problems. That is not going to inspire the base to come out and vote. That's not going to get non-voters to want to come out and vote for someone who, again, is going to do the same regime change war policy and allow the military industrial complex to run roughshod over him. Hello everyone, I am here with an absolutely fascinating guest, someone who I think a lot of you probably would have never suspected would come on The Humanist Report a couple of years ago, but now I am here with newly woke Peter Dow, author of Digital Civil War Confronting the Far Right Menace. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the program. Great to be here, thanks for having me. Yeah, and for everyone who um, missed the tweet, we actually, this isn't the first time me and Peter talked, we spoke about a year ago, I want to say, and... What I noticed and really what surprised me was that like we had more in common than previously thought. And what I think that we realized, you know, I can't speak for you, Peter, is that I think we kind of developed this mutual understanding and mutual respect and acknowledgement that we have a common enemy. We have common policy goals. And even though we have disagreements with each other, deeply rooted disagreements, I still think it's important that we kind of talk and have this conversation. I completely agree. You know, you and I, in the very beginning of the phase where I decided to move past 2016, start reaching out, you were actually one of the first people who was willing to do that. Um, we had a good dialogue through Twitter. Um, and you know what? I went to your uh, website and I looked at your issue positions, which are probably the most detailed of anybody I've ever seen <laughs> online, I mean, which is wonderful. And I was just going down the list and thinking, boy, this guy, Mike, really, I think I agree with him on 95% of this stuff. Um, and that was sort of, um, it was really nice to see. And, and I appreciate how willing you've been. To, to get this dialogue going. And of course, over the past six months, nine months, uh, since you and I started talking, it's developed further and I've continued to uh, you know, reach out, unblock people, try to connect, and just try to put the, the mess of 2016 behind us, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that if, if you and I were to have a conversation about 2016, we'd butt heads, there'd be fireworks there. But I am kind of on the same page where I don't want to think about 2016 like that is such a toxic year for a lot of us that I think the only way we possibly can defeat Republicans is if we try to move forward. And there's still going to be these deep rooted disagreements that we have and that, you know, the Bernie wing and the Hillary wings have. But if there's some way we can put that aside and try to talk about, you know, how we're alike rather than how we're different. I do think that that can be uh, really fruitful. Now, I do want to talk about your book because um, I'm grateful that you actually offered to come on my show first when you're doing your press tour. That is greatly appreciated. It's kind of, you know, in the, in the way that you've been trying to extend an olive branch. Now, from what I understand, you've quoted progressives like Kyle Kulinski in the book. Rumor has it, I may be in the book as well quoted. So can you talk about this book? Because what you do is you basically, you go into detail with this really thorough analysis about how the Republican Party has essentially weaponized social media and they used this to catapult themselves to political power. Can you talk about this? Yes, absolutely. Can I get back to one thing, Mike, that you mentioned that I think is important before we move to that? Absolutely. When you said, when you said let's set aside our differences from 2016, I love how you said that, right? Because I agree with you. We, we're not in a position to tell people who suffer like pain and harassment and trolling, you know, hey, just forget about it and move on, right? And mm -hmm. so set aside or hit the pause button is a type of language I'm using. All I'm asking is, let's get focused for the battle ahead in 2020, but I'm not dismissing or minimizing, or I don't think you are either, on both sides, whatever grievances there were and pain and, 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 and deep frustration, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to re sort of reaffirm what you said about how to approach this, not to dismiss what people felt. Absolutely. But to just say, you see what I'm saying? No, and I'll, I'll say to kind of to, you know, um, piggyback off of that, like there are still people who I know who were Clinton supporters and me being a brother of the Bernard, you know, was then and still am. 
it's t right. like I haven't had conversations with them about this, you know, and one day maybe this will happen. Maybe one day you and I can hash this out in a way. But for now, I, I don't think it's important to relitigate 2016 just because those feelings are still there. So I think that that's good that you made that clarification because it's not a matter of dismissing it. Like, again, you and I have extreme um, disagreements when it comes to this intra-party warfare. But for now, I do think that building bridges is important because we have to expand the coalition. We have to somehow try to move past that because if bernie is the nominee then i want hillary clinton's 2016 supporters to vote for him and i'm sure the same is true for you if somebody you know from the establishment wing wins so i think that not minimizing people's feelings is a really important thing to emphasize so i'm glad that you kind of added that caveat Okay, great. So we're on the same page. And frankly, I think we would probably agree on a lot more about 2016. But let me get, so to get to the book, right? Mm -hmm. I've been in politics for 20 years now, and I've never written a book. I've always wanted to write and people have kept saying because I've done, you know, thousands of blog posts and tweets and I've been writing since 2000. But I finally thought, you know what, I need to write down in a book form, what is going on with the with the with with the deeper moral arguments at the root of all these fights we have online? And digital civil war was really me just echoing my childhood, where I grew up in an actual civil war in Beirut. And I thought, you know what? I see. I know what it's like when people are battling. And what's really interesting about a real civil war is not everybody's fighting, right? There are people just going about their lives in areas that don't have conflict, you know, going to movies and doing their thing. But then on the, in the, on the battlefields, you have this intense fight. So like you and me are part of politics on a daily basis, right? It's, you know, it's what we do. But there are a lot of people who think, oh, you know, this is overblown. There's really not really a war happening. You're exaggerating. But my attitude is, look, the stuff that's going on online is radicalizing the far right. People who are shooting up schools, churches, mosques, whatever, they're getting radicalized in this digital battlefield, right? Also, these huge fights that we have about the immigration border policy, for example, universal health care, they affect people's lives. So when I say digital civil war, it was in contrast to people say soft civil war or cold civil war. That's way too anodyne for me. There's nothing cold about kids sitting in cages. You know, there's nothing cold about people not having health care and losing their health care. So for me, it's like there's a battlefield and some of us are on this battlefield and fighting these really essential fights about our country and, and what it represents. So that's really the essence of the book. And I dig into the moral questions. Inequality, for example, uh, you talk about, uh, you know, quoting you, quoting Kyle, quoting others, even the Chapo guys, for example, right? So I, what, what, what it, it, I'm essentially trying to say, look, there's this whole discussion of inequality that really I got to give credit to Bernie Sanders for raising that. This is something that's been dear to me for many years. That's why I was a fan of Bernie before 2016 went down and we all started fighting, right? But it's a crucially important issue. I live in New York where I see $50 million condos being bought and sold by these hedge fund guys who don't even live in them. And then I'm looking at other places in the country where kids can't afford school supplies. That's a deep injustice, right? So that's really, for me, the essence of the book is to dig through all these issues one by one and show how the battles play out. Yeah, and I think that that's really interesting. You've touched on a lot there. And one thing that I got to say that really helped increase the respect that I had for you was really this recognition that things that we need to do to get to where we want to be politically are no longer taboo. Like, for example, I know a lot of people who kind of come from the wing of the party that you were previously part of try to make it seem as if, you know, you can't criticize Democrats because the Republican Party is such an existential threat, and they are. But at the same time, I like that you've started to really take a more direct approach in realizing that we have to acknowledge that there are some people on our side, Democratic Party leadership, you speak out about them quite uh, frequently, that if we want to be where we need to be, we have to call them out as well and we have to hold them accountable. So one thing that I really wanted to ask you about was you, you recently kind of had this political awakening over the course of a couple of years. And what I noticed now is that you're taking a lot of heat from Hillary Clinton supporters who were previously on your side saying, Peter, you know, I don't know why you're doing this. You're only doing this to promote a book. And then I see Bernie supporters say the same thing. So you're kind of catching heat from both sides. And so basically what I want to ask you is what do you say to people who are skeptical? What do you say to people who think that, you know, this new Peter Dow, this 
you know, uh, newly woke Peter is just doing this for publicity or whatever. What do you say to those people? Because there's a lot of skepticism in politics, and I think for good reason. So how do we convince those people that um, you really are the real deal and, you know, what you're saying you mean? Well, there's a very simple answer to it. I ask people to just use Google and go back to who I was in 2001, 2, 3, and 4. Look, I joined politics after being a house music producer um, in 2000. And I joined 2001 Democratic Underground, which at the time was really the only message board for us disaffected Democrats and progressives who were trying to fight the right and there's nowhere to go. So the early days were like chat rooms, message boards, online, and then at the beginning of blogs, right, 2002, Mm -hmm. 2003. So I entered politics as an anti-Iraq war activist, as a progressive activist, environmental activist, human rights. This was my life because I grew up in a war. And, And for me, it was like I was just fighting these human rights battles um, that I cared about. So if people go back and look at my history, the record is out there. I think one of the problems, Mike, is that so many people just got introduced to me in 2016. Mm -hmm. It's like this guy's some DNC shill. But I tell people the story of my life for 15 years before that election. I was the progressive Netroots guy, right? The blog guy who people like Kerry and Hillary and even Arlen Specter when he became a Democrat, it's like, we need you to connect us to the blogosphere, right? That was back in the blog days before social media. And if you look at my writings, if, if you even go back to when I was, you know, I started up with Chank Huger, with Glenn Greenwald, with Dave Sirota. That was the community that I first began my career with, right? Those guys were buddies. Like Glenn and I used to hang out. Chank and I used to hang out, um, like way back, 2001, 2002. That's interesting. Yeah, I've, I've been in this game a long time. Like this is the thing, but you, I can't fault people who saw me in 2016 and got the wrong impression of who I am, I totally get it, right? Because I was defending Hillary Clinton, you know, like I was in the trenches with her and I was fighting back hard. And I look, I overdid it. Many of us overdid it. We got caught up in a battle where we got really defensive and thus really aggressive. And I started being seen as the guy who was going after progressives, which was quite painful to me because that is my community. So this is less an awakening for me and more like a coming home. Like, I consider myself a progressive activist who thought I'm going to get inside the system, inside the belly of the Washington beast, and try to change it from within. But you know what happens is you can't really change it from within. And now I'm starting to see that, you know what, I got to get back on the outside of this thing right now. And I got to start going after the structure from the outside, right? Going after this establishment status quo structure from the outside. So I, I only ask people to look back at the sweep of my whole career and look at me in 2008, for example when Obama was elected, there were only three or four people in my position, like somebody who had been in the Democratic Party, who was going after him on drones, on civil liberties. I basically accused him of continuing Bush's policies, but making them worse. The Aulicki case, extrajudicial killings, right? Assassinating Americans with no due process. That was on Obama. And I called him out on it, right? I called him out for being too, too sort of not, not aggressive enough on, on health care you know, when Obamacare was first pushed. So I only ask people, go back and look at who I was for all those years. And yes, I got in the middle of a battle in 2016 where I thought, I want to elect Hillary and I'm going to do everything I can to do it. And I think it's the right thing to do. And people may disagree. But here I am today saying, you know what? I got to reconnect with my friends, reconnect with my roots and get back to the guy on the outside, you know, going after the system because the system is broken, Mike. You know it, right? I mean, Things are so much worse off now than when I started 20 years ago. That makes me look at myself and say, what have I screwed up? What have Mm -hmm. I done wrong? Right? Because back then, the people like, you know, Trump and Bolton, these guys were like fringe, you know, Stephen Miller. These were fringe people, even at sites like Free Republic. And now they're running the country and Fox is in the White House. So whatever I did, I wasn't very successful. And I have to ask my friends and all of us as activists, there's something wrong and we got to we got to you know really look at ourselves and then get to work. And I want to quote someone from uh Twitter, I believe it is pretty bad lefty who said Peter Dow is basically the only person who learned anything from 2016 because you are willing to be introspective and I think that that's important. Now, basically I think that the reason why these types of discussions um and conversations in general are important is because Even if we don't always agree, understanding is important. So let me pose this question to you because I honestly was only introduced to you in 2016. So my initial, you know, um, 
introduction to Peter Dow was, oh, this is just a Hillary Clinton shill. You know, it was it was obviously right, right. I had that caricature of you built up in my mind and I didn't really know you. So let me ask you this. As someone who is progressive, who has this history of criticizing Obama, which I absolutely agree with you with, um, what is it that made you, for lack of a better word, abandon that core progressive ideology and go for Clinton instead of Bernie Sanders? Because this is the way that I see it. If someone is super progressive and ideologically speaking, you finally have a candidate who really is talking about social democracy and universal redistributive programs, what made you kind of lean more towards Hillary Clinton as opposed to Bernie Sanders? And I also want to follow that up by asking, what was it that kind of catalyzed this introspective view that you had, thinking maybe I wasn't going about this the right way in terms of talking to people? Okay, that, that, those are two excellent questions. So let me take them one at a time. The first one with Hillary was a combination of personal in other words, I got to know her in 2008. Now, mm. she hired me. There was a New York Times article when I got hired that sort of sort of uh, confirms what I'm telling you. Basically, the article said, Hillary Clinton hires Peter Dow to reach out to bloggers in the progressive community, right? That's why she brought me on board. And I said, okay, I'll do it. Now, a lot of my friends said, what on earth are you doing working for Hillary Clinton, right, if you're mm. this progressive guy? And my answer was, look, I want to build bridges between my community, which was the net roots at the time, that's what it was called then, and the Democratic Party leadership. And of course, Hillary represented the pinnacle of that, having been in the White House of First Lady, Senator, et cetera. So I sat down with Hillary, you know, I got to know her, and you know, I started at that point feeling that, you know, certain priorities of, of what were important to me, primarily, primarily women's rights and women's equality, and the issue of a, a woman never having been elected president. So I had differences with her on policy issues, whether it was Iraq, of course, because I was an anti-war protester. So, so with with Hillary, so I worked for 2008, 9, 10, you know, d during those years, and, and over those years, getting to know her personally, of course, when you know someone in person, it's very different from the caricature, as you said, that, that you had of me and that, I, that others had of her. And so during that period, um, in, because in 2016, I didn't officially work for her. I was just doing it because I was continuing the mission I had in 2008. Now, to me, women's rights and the oppression of women across the globe is a, you know, I grew up in the Middle East, so you know how women are treated in the Middle East. It was mm -hmm. a pr sort of a primary issue to me. As Jimmy Carter said, President Jimmy Carter, you know, is one of the great travesties of humankind, the oppression of women and girls across the globe, okay? And so for me on a personal level with, with my family, you know, I felt, okay, getting a woman in the White House and one who is certainly immensely qualified, uh, uh, who I agree with on a number of issues, maybe not the entire uh, – sort of like her philosophy of the country, but certainly a woman who I would be comfortable in the White House. So it became a fight for me, Mike. It's like, I'm going to elect her. I'm going to fight the right. And a lot of it was like fighting the right because the right wing takedown of Hillary Clinton is exactly what they're doing to AOC and Ilhan Omar now. Mm -hmm. So it was this, okay, I don't want this right wing system to beat me. It became really personal for me. So in 2016, it's like, I'm going to pick up where I left off in 2008. I'm just on the outside of the campaign. I don't work for her. I'm not paid by her. But I didn't, and in 2015, I was praising Bernie Sanders. I mean, again, Google will help people who are skeptical. <laughs> I was writing stuff like, yay, wow, we got Bernie Sanders talking about inequality, and we have Hillary, who could be the first woman president, bringing all these issues so important to, to girls, you know, as a role model. And then 2016, he started talking about the Wall Street speeches and some of those issues. And, and like I said, when you support somebody that strongly, you start fighting back. Mm -hmm. And it just went off the rails. I and I and, and you know, I apologize for people that I hurt in that process. You know, my wife and I took, as you know, a tremendous amount of heat as well. Mm -hmm. Death threats. You know, it, it was a year in which, and I've written about this, you know, we lost our first baby together uh, to an ectopic pregnancy. She had emergency surgery. So in the middle of 2016, my mm -hmm. wife is on an operating table like two months out of the election, could have lost her life. So yeah. it was one of those years that I never ever want to relive again. That's one of the sure. reasons to answer your, your second question is like, what made me start rethinking? But look, you know, the fight for Hillary, once I'm in the trenches with somebody, I was, you know, I was trained, uh, you know, I was drafted into the military at 15 years old. I lived through awards. Like once you're in the trenches, you fight, right? Yeah. You don't abandon that person. And, but the end result of that was like people now 
started seeing me as this DNC shill. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, then, so, so anyway, so that's what happened in 2016. I did not agree with Hillary on everything. I certainly don't. I've been critical of her on issues. I don't agree with Bernie Sanders on everything, but frankly, probably had Hillary not been running, I would have been a Bernie Sanders supporter. No mm-hmm. doubt about that. Cause people like Wellstone and Sanders were the people who I looked up to and, and ad- admired in the years before that election. Sure. And and that's really interesting because, again, like we won't agree on the reasoning, but I do want to understand, like I recently had a conversation on Twitter with someone who supported Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but didn't support Bernie. And to me, I don't I don't understand it because ideologically speaking, they're very similar. Maybe AOC is slightly to the left of Bernie, but I think that just understanding will help progressives, and I'm sure you would agree, kind of reach out outside of the echo chamber, outside of our bubble to kind of bring people in. So here's what I want to pose to you, because I don't want there to be just like one person who does what Peter Dow does and kind of tries to extend this olive branch. I want more Peter Dows, um, if I can use your name as kind of like a an example. So what could I have told you back in 2016? Let's imagine you and I butting heads on Twitter What could I have told you that would have made you less skeptical about me as someone who is largely viewed as a Bernie bro? What could I have told you to convince you that I'm coming from this position, not, you know, um, in bad faith, but in good faith? What do you think somebody like me could have said to you, if anything, that would have convinced you back then? You know, you're you're a really straight shooting guy, clearly, and you're being honest. So I'm going to you know, I'm going to, I like to do that too. That's the person I am. So I'm just going to respond honestly. I don't know if there was anything you could have said, because mm-hmm. at the point you start seeing other people as, I don't want to say enemy, but as like a, a bitter rival, right? I don't know that I was really listening that carefully. I was angry. And a lot of people were angry on both sides, right? And I and I tell people this, you know, I've been talking to people over the past week as part of, as part of the book release. And what I've said is, look, You know, sometimes the closest people, people you're in a relationship with, you know, uh, your close family, your parents are the most bitter fights when you fight. And they can be explosive to the point of violence. Most violence is domestic violence that, that, that we see when these sort of close family fights that really, I don't know, like there's a way that love turns to hate Mm -hmm. and in, in, in a, when people are close because they care about the other person's opinion, right? I cared that the progressive community saw me that way. It hurt me. And it, but I take responsibility for what I did to get to that point. Um, so I think the answer to your question is a tough one. Now, how do we get people to do it? It's exactly what we're doing. Just you and me talking, um, seeing that we're human beings, we're coming from a principled place. There were a segment of people you and I know who just wanted to make trouble, who wanted to attack and harass. I'm not going to forgive or ask other people, hey, you got harassed and trolled and subjected to these horrible things. Hey, you just have to forget it. So it's more like we're here now. It's 2019 going to 2020. So what I would recommend to you to do and to others, what I would recommend to others is look inside yourself, ask yourself, what are your priorities? We are facing fascism, Mike. You know it and I know it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's one thing you and I could have ideological differences about capitalism, about socialism, about political theory and social theory and economic theory. But that's more really academic in, in, in some instances. What we're facing is like an existential threat right now to the rule of law and democracy or anything that's left of it. I realize, and I, I know you know this, that some people may say it's just the way the capitalist system is set up, but I'm just not really a political scientist or or really an expert on those issues. I was a house music musician, you know what I'm saying? I was a mm-hmm. jazz keyboardist who got into activism. I don't know enough about economic and political theory to make these sort of macro, um, you know, um, sort of analysis of what's the better system. All I know is I'm seeing children being shot in schoolrooms in their in their classrooms. I'm she, I'm seeing migrant children being stolen from their parents. That is an atrocity. I mean, there is no greater torture. Those of us who are parents understand no greater torture than taking your child away and you don't know where they are and they, you may never see them again. You might as well kill somebody rather than do that to them. And yet our government is doing that in our name. We are droning babies in other countries from from missiles that come out of the sky and blow up toddlers, okay? All these things are happening. So me, I'm just like a very direct action type of activist. Like I don't know the theory well enough, 
but I see these injustices, I'm just going to speak out about them. And I ask others to focus on that. Like, what do you want for 2020? Do you want to sit there and fight over whether, you know, uh, the DNC rigged it or not for the next three years? You're never going to win that battle. One person is going to say it was rigged and one person is going to say it's not. And you're never going to get to a conclusion. And you and I have very strong feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I've learned to sort of set those feelings aside. Just focus on these injustices. You know, there is so much injustice around us that I just can't look backwards. I just took that rearview mirror and I smashed it. That's for me. For others, can do what they want to do. But that's that's my approach. Well, let me ask you this, because I know that you coming on this show, you're going to take heat from Hillary Clinton supporters, and I'm assuming I'll take some heat for Bernie supporters because it is kind of difficult to kind of let your guard down and listen to someone if you've been on the opposite sides for so long, if you've been butting heads, you know. So I saw a Twitter or a Reddit thread that referred to me as the quintessential Bernie bro. So let me ask you if you have any questions for me because I kind of picked your brain and I want to kind of flip it and see if you want to ask the quintessential Bernie Brony questions, because, you know, it, for me, it, I'll, let me just explain my position. It, it's never been about Bernie yeah. for me. Like, even if I'm a supporter of Bernie Sanders, for me, it's always been that Bernie is a conduit to the ideal, you know, not necessarily 100% perfect society, but a way in which we can achieve these goals. So if somebody else comes along and is better than Bernie, I jump ship immediately if I feel as if they can win. So that's basically what it's been about to me. So did you want to yeah, pick well, my well, brain in that way? Yeah, I do. Actually, you actually just sort of sent me started answering the question that I was going to ask you, because part of my growth here over the past year is to start seeing that I want to be my own leader. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be defending or following one, you know, another politician. Yeah, I'll vote for them. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll criticize them or I'll support them. But what is your feeling? Because you do your thing, right? You got the show, you've set this all up. This is, you know, you're an entrepreneur and you're, you, 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 you get your positions across. You built a strong audience. How do you feel about the notion of us becoming our own leaders, no matter what it is we do, whether it's podcasting or whether it's blogging or tweeting or organizing or canvassing versus focusing all our energy on one politician? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. And basically part of the reason I started this podcast is because I wanted people who were usually politically apathetic to get involved and realize that they can't just wait once every four years for a presidential election to take action. Like politics is always happening. Politics is embedded in everything and it influences every single aspect of our lives. So basically one of the main reasons why I started the show was I wanted to empower people to take action into their own hands and realize that this is their government. Like they own the U S government. You are the boss of every single politician because yep, you're, yep. you're paying their paychecks, your tax exactly. dollars fund them. So if you have a representative that isn't representing you adequately, call them up, leave them a message, challenge them. Basically, my goal has been to really personalize politics and not make it seem as this really complex thing. Like I kind of visualize the target audience being like my mom, for example, who right. has these underlying principles of like equality that she supports and ending poverty, but isn't necessarily as politically engaged because she doesn't know about all of the ins and outs. Because if you just tune into MSNBC or CNN, you're not going to get a fundamental understanding of really what's happening. So my goal really is to break it down on the most elementary level. You know, so people understand what's happening and why politicians do the things that they do. So what are some of the root causes? Because I don't think you can really get politically engaged and involved unless you understand what's happening. So to kind of explain how institutions work, how money and politics influences politicians, why politicians do things that really are against common sense. Like, why are we allowing Saudi Arabia to use our weapons to bomb, bomb babies in Yemen, you know? So if people understand the causal mechanisms, then I think it makes them, it gives them this sense that they can take action because you can't really address a problem unless you know what the problem is. And that really is empowering to people. Just knowledge in general is empowering. But, you know, at the same time, the reason why I've been trying to expand who I reach and, you know, I'll be debating a, a Republican in, mm -hmm. in the next month is because there's a lot of competing philosophies and you know peter there's scapegoating you know right. donald trump will say it's immigrants that are the cause of your problems but for me i take this macro approach and i say 
No, it's the system. Capitalism corrupts everything. And I know that you're not necessarily on board with, you know, democratic socialism and whatnot, but this is basically the well, way well, that maybe. I approach That's, it. Well, well, let me say this. Like, I, my position on that... Here, here's the thing. Like, I studied philosophy in college, right? But you know, I, 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 I know that isms and ists, if they're used incorrectly and imprecisely, can create more problems. Like, I've seen, you know, uh, you know, sophisticated thinkers and academics completely disagree on interpretations of these things. So my attitude is: Look, I don't know enough to know which system is the better system. So I'm not like pro-capitalist or socialist or democratic socialist or social democrat. I really just say: Look, I see injustices in front of me and I'm going to fight against them and I'm going to leave it to people who know a lot more than I do about the systemic issues. I do know one thing and I agree with you 100%. The system is not just broken, but the system is set up to maintain the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. Because the people who are in power right now don't want to lose power. You know, there's some great books like uh, Nancy McLean's Democracy in Chains and others that talk about the, you know, the, the oligarchs who are completely anti-democratic who have now used the Republican Party as their vehicle. And of course, we know the Democratic Party is not fighting it for whatever their reason, either they're not capable or they don't want to. And again, uh, it's important to distinguish. I don't think Democrats are nearly as bad as Republicans, and I don't want to ever have a false equivalence there. I always want to put that on the table. But you know, the Democratic Party is not doing what needs to be done, or we wouldn't be where we are today. So I completely am with you that there needs to be some systemic change at a deep level. And I can understand how people see Bernie Sanders as a vehicle for that change because he's going after the establishment. Now, by the same token, if you define establishment too widely, you can try to start pulling in people who get deeply offended by that because it's like, wait a minute, you know, we're fighting for issues, but we are not the establishment. Mm. Look, it's tough, Mike. It's really tough. This stuff is really difficult, right? I mean, we are fighting a battle where we live in a world of, of profound injustice, a system that is geared to just to take care of the 0.1 of the 1%. And we, all of us are just minions in their, in their lives, you know, and, and yeah. we can't let that happen. We have to stand up and fight back. And it's scary sometimes. It's not what, you know, what you do is courageous. You know, I, I try to be brave and be out there. I get threats all the time from all sides, right? Mm -hmm. um, primarily, of course, the, the far right, because I go after them. But we, what do we do? Say nothing, you yeah. know, give up. See what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I want to kind of end, um, I'll give you the last word, but I what I want to do is, because I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of Hillary Clinton supporters or just people from that wing of the party who will watch this, and assuming that there's going to be a lot of Bernie supporters, I kind of want to explain my position to the Hillary people, and I want to give you the opportunity to explain your position to the Bernie people. Um, because I think that really the overall, you know, I think goal is just understanding, not agreement. Right. We're not going to agree on everything. Um, that's That's definitely something that may be achievable in the future. But for now, it's just understanding. And for me, a lot of people, I think that the number one criticism of me um, is that I go after the Democratic Party too much. And I think right. there's this justifiable worry that why would you want to demonize the only party that keeps Republicans from getting power? And mm -hmm. I think that that is a legitimate concern. But for me, I actually kind of come from this this um, political science background where I study other countries that, you know, I got my master's in comparative politics. And See, I, go, right? yeah, I look at these um, political opposition parties from around the world. And I see that if they're not strong enough in the face of right wing craziness, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. that doesn't just mean that people are going to be worse off. That literally could be the demise of democracy. So one example I always cite on my show is Turkey, you know, the reason why Erdogan currently is not consolidating democracy and is instead consolidating his own power is because the opposition party, the party on the left in Turkey, is so weak that mm -hmm. he's been able to essentially do whatever he wants. And I kind of sit here in terror as I see the same thing happen in the United States. We have right. an opposition party that's so weak and we have a party that is so far off the spectrum. You know, Republicans are just they're fascistic now. I don't think you correct, can really correct. disagree. No, they are. It. We just have to call it what it is. That's what they are. We have to call point. it what it is. Yeah. yeah. So the only way I ever see us getting out of this mess is if we have a party that actually fights them tooth and nail. And that's essentially the reason why I'm so hard on Democrats. It's not necessarily because, you know, I'm the secret uh, Republican operative who wants to bring them down. Right, right, I'm right, trying exactly. to basically look at it from the standpoint of, 
you know, if this was my child where, you know, your, your child is like a crackhead and you want to shake them and say, wake the fuck up. You know, I mean, not the yeah, best analogy, I, but that's where I'm no, coming from. I hear what you're saying. No, I totally hear. It. Look, I, I think you're going to find that a lot more people who you would consider and let's even move it past Hillary and Bernie, like generally speaking, mm -hmm. you know, Democrats, progressives, leftists who come from different angles are starting to agree that. Like on the impeachment issue, I've been arguing forcefully for impeachment. If you don't impeach Donald Trump, there's no point in having impeachment in the Constitution. Yeah. Similarly with stuff like uh, Brett Kavanaugh, to, they, Democrats should have simply walked out of that hearing. You, you don't empower and legitimize this uh, authoritarian takeover of our government. I mean these people have no respect for the rule of law. Same with mm -hmm. you know the, the hearings today with Barr. So I think – you and I are coming from the same place on how, why the Democratic Party needs to be pushed. Look, we elect people to push them in the right direction. You don't just elect people and sit back and say, you know, we trust them, right? And, and so I think that, you know, I've argued with a lot of people who just come out and tell me, trust Pelosi or, or trust Schumer or whatever. I'm not going to trust anybody. I, I don't like where we are, and I don't think they know how to get us out of here. I don't, you know, in some cases in the Democratic leadership and the establishment in Washington that I encountered when I worked there, I don't know that they want to change the system right so you yeah. know there's motive you know what i'm saying like there's do they know how to do they want to and i don't want to impugn individual people necessarily but when they're screwing up we're going to call them out on it so i i think look getting to know you reading your policy positions you know you're clearly a thoughtful person who who cares about the country right and you're trying to come Thank about you. it so i would ask i would ask people who would otherwise not look at you because of the whole Bernie Hillary stuff or, or pay attention to what you're saying. It's to go just go to your, your, your website or, 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 or to watch your show and just say, you know, look at what this guy's talking about, you know, and, and for me, this is how you and I connecting. I think many people can do this. And on the ground, it happens. Look, there are people who connect on the, on the ground level, on the organizing level, who do what you and I are doing. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes in the digital realm, it's a little bit people more standoffish and more tribalist and yeah. sort of mob, mobs form. But but look, this is this is one. This is a wonderfully inspiring conversation for me. I really I, I like what you do. I respect how open you were. I ask other people to just say, look, you know, <laughs> let me if I can just get back to the beginning. Sure. People say, you know, I'm doing this to sell a book, or I'm do, you know, I'm, I'm I'm grifting, and I laugh. I say, wait a minute, if I wanted to grift, I'd go right. I wouldn't go left. You know, the money's <laughs> not on the left, right? So I, I always laugh when people say you're grifting. It's like, look, I'm just following my gut instincts. I'm just some dude who was a musician who like just wants to help people, right? I just want to leave a better world behind for my family. Maybe I'm not doing it the right way. Maybe I am, but believe me, I'm coming from a sincere place. I mean, it's like I. This is my whole life. This is all I do. You know, my wife and I like, you know, we don't make money from doing this. We we, we just care. So, yeah. and I know you do. And I know you do too. And a lot of people out there do. So, you know, I hope we can all come together. This feels good to talk to you. Yeah, it does. It, it, it absolutely does. And did you want to close by like any specific targeted message to people who you were basically previously butting heads with? Like, what would you say to the Bernie, to the Bernie supporters, you know, who right. are, are still skeptical? Because look, there's... You're not going to be able to erase skepticism. People will be skeptical of me saying, oh, Mike's bringing on Peter Dowd because he wants clicks, you know, because people right, I'm right, sure right, will want right. to watch. So the skepticism in this climate, I think, is justified because you have to be skeptical because really we're in this place where people are cynical for good reason. But I mean, I just want to open the floor to you and let you kind of have the last word here and say what you need to say. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Look, you can't, you can only earn respect. There's something I learned, you know, as a Lebanese guy, right, in Lebanon, where respect and dignity and honor are extremely more prioritized than they are in our culture in America. So for me, you know, dignity and honor, sometimes that's why I'm so contentious and I fight with people. I know I piss people off. Look, no matter what I say, Mike, I'm going to piss somebody off. I've learned that. The right, left, center, Hillary, Bernie, people, whoever, you know, it's like, and that's okay. I've been doing this 20 years and I know there are going to be people who are going to just want to go after me and question my motives, and that's all fine. When I call it a digital civil war in my book, because it's a battleground, right? It's a battleground out there, and I'm going to take my hits. I'm going to take punches. I'm going to throw punches back. But all, all, all I really would like to say to people is we all – can disagree without impugning the integrity of another person. I, you know, every time, you know, somebody doesn't agree with what I'm saying, I don't have to say you're a horrible person at the core. I can just say, look, I vehemently disagree with you. You're just dead wrong and leave it there. We've, we've learned to just go to the next level and say, you're horrible. Mm -hmm. And, and we need to learn to stop that. I need to learn to also, you know, understand, you know, people's skepticism. That's what I'm trying to do. You know, 
I, I make jokes about my 2016 self with people who were attacking me, who I had blocked back then, <laughs> because you got to have a sense of humor, right? Yeah. For human beings. So, so that that's all I say. Like I, I, I know I have to earn respect of all sides, not just Bernie Sanders support, not Hillary support. Anybody I'm out there, you know, sort of dealing with politically, people will only know me through my act, through my actions, my words, and my intellectual honesty. And if that comes across, great. And if it doesn't, I'll keep working. So that, that's sort of where I'm at. All right. Well, Peter Dow, it's been a great conversation. The book is Digital Civil War, Confronting the Far-Right Menace. Peter, tell us when the book comes out and where people can purchase it. It just came out literally yesterday. So thanks for asking. And, you know, anywhere where books are sold, um, it's really just actually digitalcivilwar.info um, will take you to all independent booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere else where they sell books. And, you know, look, the book is my, my life's learning. 20 years of doing politics is my first book, you know. So it's like everything I've learned, I threw it in that book. And hopefully it helps others understand what the hell is going on with this with our country because this is terrifying times and it's going to get worse before it gets better and that's what's so scary to me so we got to all step up all right well thank you so much for coming on hopefully this will be the first of many conversations and i hope that other people kind of do the same thing and try to just you know be more open-minded and talk to people who they previously disagreed with and maybe still do disagree with so thanks so much for coming on peter it's a pleasure thank you thank you for being so open i appreciate it well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far in the program. As usual, I want to thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members and send a special shout out to all of our iTunes and SoundCloud listeners. Um, Hopefully you guys enjoyed the episode. It's a little bit shorter than usual because I've had a little bit of complaints that... um. The show's getting a little bit long, but this is mostly due to me having guests for the last couple of weeks. So anyways, I've talked too much. I'll see you all next week. This has been The Humanist Report. My name is Mike Figueredo. Take care, everyone.